Here we go, everybody. So hi, my name is Cora Peck. As you all may know, I am the admin for your Pudental Neurology Hope Facebook group. I want to welcome Dr. Michael Hibner from Arizona Center for Chronic Pelvic Pain. Uh, thank you for taking the time to chat with us and answer our questions. Um, could you please tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into the specialty? Cora, thank you. And uh, thank you to the group for inviting me. I, you know, I have been familiar with Pudendal Hope for, for so many, many years. Um, of course, I don't go on the group. I am not the part of the group, but I have been familiar with your wonderful group and the work you're doing for uh, the Pudendal patients. So. Um, I'm Michael Hebner. I am originally from Warsaw, Poland, and uh, this is where I went to medical school. In 1994, I uh, moved to the United States to Chicago. I did my residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. In 2000, I moved to Arizona and I started a fellowship in pelvic reconstructive surgery and uh, uh, advanced gynecological surgery at Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale under legendary surgeon Dr. Javier Magrina. So I was really one of the first uh, Da Vinci robotic trained surgeons at that time. Uh, when I graduated from my fellowship in 2003, I, I developed um, a big interest in treating patients with chronic pelvic pain. And um, so at that time, it was mostly endometriosis and all the other reasons for, uh, for chronic pelvic pain. But soon I started seeing patients who had the pain. I couldn't explain what it was. I, I never learned about it in any of my uh, schooling, and uh, I literally Googled it. I, I Googled the symptoms of pudendal neuralgia. Um, well, once I Googled, Googled the symptoms and the name pudendal neuralgia came up, uh, basically, I went on Medline, the online medical library, and I found very few articles on this topic, but they were all, or most of them, were written by the same author, who is Roger Robert. And Roger Robert is a French neurosurgeon from Nantes, France, so I... Um, guess I had the audacity to write him a letter, not an email, I didn't have his email, I wrote him a letter in French, uh, and a friend helped me write a letter to, to ask him if he can come and uh, if I can come and, and work with him for a little bit. Uh, my hospital at that time where I worked was very much against the idea, so I actually had to take my own uh, vacation and pay my own way to go there, uh, but I spent time with him. When I returned to the United States, I started doing those surgeries. Um, in late 2005, um, and uh, seeing a lot of patients. Um, in 2011, I actually traveled again to Austria to work with Dr. Oscar Ashman, who, who does a different type of, of pudendal surgery. So I also worked with him a little bit. In the meantime, around 2006, I started a fellowship in um, a which, which is called advanced gynecological surgery, but I trained 14 fellows hoping that some of them will follow my footsteps and, and see patients for pelvic pain and, and pudendal neuralgia. Um, very few of them are practicing this, uh, this medicine right now, and you probably know who they are. If, if there are still any left that do that. Um, because of the changes in the hospital where I work, because of the administrative changes and billing changes and, and many other things, in the uh, year 2020, I uh, left the hospital together with a big group of doctors. It, it, it wasn't my um, will to leave the hospital, but um, basically um, a, a lot of changes in the institution that a lot of, a lot of us left. Uh, it was the height of the COVID. Um, I, uh, the only chance for me to stay in the area, and I, I have uh, kids in college here, and my wife is... Um, uh, a physician here in town, I, I could not uh, basically just move somewhere else. So I, I started my own private practice. Um, over the years um, of me um, practicing pudendal neuralgia surgery, I've actually cr created a lot of modifications of the original French surgery and many other surgeries. So things like using the pain pump during the surgery, things like reattaching the sacred tuberous ligament, wrapping the nerve in the nerve wraps or with amniotic cells. Um, th those were big changes that um, some of the people that I trained maybe practice, but most of the most of the surgeons, as I know, do not wrap the nerves and to prevent the rescarring, or they don't put the pain pumps to reverse that centralized central pain. Um, I also I also um, 
work on many other devices. I actually have a PhD in bioengineering, biomedical engineering. So I, I like developing devices uh, for patients, for you, for patients with putin or neuralgia. I'm, I'm currently working with an engineer who has a contract with US Navy to build the uh, the, the helmets to cool down the, the the heads of the of the people that work on the deck of the aircraft carrier. So I actually contacted him. We're building a cushion that patients will be able to sit and basically cool down the pudendal area because cold is what helps. Um, so we are in uh, in uh, fairly advanced with that already with that cushion. Uh, I already just sent a, a bicycle seat to a patent attorney to. It's a seed that I think may decrease the risk for developing pyrandon neuralgia. Please don't like, if you already have it, please don't ride a bike ever and don't get a seed thinking that it will prevent it. This is just for patients that never developed the problem. Um, my, my, my true calling though is uh, people who are injured by pelvic mesh because in a way I am a, a urogynecologist by training. So a, a big part of my practice are patients who are injured by pelvic mesh. So. I, I um, in a lot of patients, I take those meshes out. I treat the pelvic floor, um, Botox injections, nerve blocks, and eventually nerve decompression surgeries, whether it's a pudendal nerve decompression surgery or upgrade or nerve decompression surgery. Um, so for the for the patients with mesh injuries, I basically offer both uh, the mesh removals and 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 the nerve procedures. Um, also, the last thing is recently I opened a branch of, of the practice. My practice is called AZCCPP, Arizona Center for Chronic Pelvic Pain. But I, uh, being from Poland, I um, two of my friends came to train with me last summer and they're actually coming back uh, next month to train with me a little bit more. And uh, we do have a, an, an office in Warsaw, Poland. That's for our European patients. Um, uh, and I'll be traveling there um, probably three to four times a year to do some of the nerve decompression surgeries. Again, I'll only be there for a short time. It's a short visit to, to my hometown. Um, so I won't be doing that many of those surgeries, but I'll be doing some. Uh, so that's my introduction. But I think before we go on uh, with your questions and questions from Cora, I think I need to address the um, elephant in the room because I know that's, that's an issue. And the elephant in the room is that my practice, as uh, you probably know, is the cash only practice and patients are asking, why aren't we taking the insurance? So when I was um, working for the hospital, for St. Joseph's Hospital, uh, I was uh, primarily still doing mostly, not mostly, but I was doing a lot of other gynecological procedures, endometriosis, hysterectomies, uh, uh, fibroids, etc. cetera. Uh, and those were the procedures that were paying for the practice uh, that pelvic floor procedures, the pudendal nerve decompression, Botox injections, and all the procedures for the pelvic floor are very poorly, if ever, reimbursable by um, uh, the insurance. There's sim simply no CPT codes, no ICD-9 codes, and the insurance doesn't pay for that. The hospital, the, because mm -hmm. I was an employee of the hospital, very heavily subsidized uh, my practice. So we were allowed to continue because uh, there was a lot of goodwill in the hospital to do that. They said, "They said, well, you're going to bring the money by doing the endometriosis, and you know, on the side, if you want to see some do pudendal cases, that that just gives our hospital a good name." But, but that was not reimbursable. Uh, when I left and I opened my insurance, uh, my, I'm sorry. When I when I left and I opened my practice in September of 2020, we did take insurance. We did take two insurances for about nine months. And after nine months, we were faced with, uh, with uh, a dilemma whether I should close the practice because, because we were not getting paid for the pelvic pain procedures. A dilemma whether to close the practice, uh, th that was one option. Um, uh, the second option was whether I should completely stop doing pudendal neuralgia, which is something I was considering, just see patients for endometriosis and fibroids and and vaginal bleeding and do his robotic hysterectomies uh, because those insurance are those procedures are covered by insurance. So I would have to drop all my pudendal patients and all the male patients, of course, or or basically take um, cash for the procedures. So we chose the option number three, uh, which I think was the right choice. But but again, uh, if the insurance doesn't doesn't uh, pay for those procedures, 
I cannot be doing the procedures which are not not reimbursed. Um, I understand that there are still some other providers, Dr. Conway, some others that that take the insurance, but those providers are employed by the hospital where their practices may be. I don't know that, but they may be subsidized by the hospital and they uh, are still doing uh, uh, other um, uh, pr procedures uh, that. Uh, Uh, they're still doing other procedures that yeah. that are reimbursable like in yeah. my like in my case they're they're, they're they're like it was in my case they're reimbursable and uh, and so so that's the reason for example right now we came up with this you know fantastic procedure which is placing the on pain pump with a ct scanner we're, we're having great results i even this morning like an hour ago i was communicating with a patient that you know, after like years of pain has such a good effect that like he had to tell me that it's a gentleman who had to tell me that. So it's a catheter that we implant. We'll talk about it later, I guess, in this interview that we implant with a CT pump. But but the hospital that is doing it, it's not my hospital. There's another hospital where the doctor works. They're already telling him that they're losing money on it because th there's no code. You can't charge for the on cue pain pump. It's a non-chargeable billable call. And they're still they're now limiting him to doing one a week. Uh, and I don't blame the hospital. They're not going to do the procedures that they can't bill for. And I think they're going to phase it out and stop doing it all together. Now, there's a plan. Me and the physician, we are planning on getting a CT scanner, getting a, a place where we will eventually do those procedures because the outcomes are so uh, stunning that that I cannot not offer it to patients. But getting a CT scanning place and getting the procedure going even the investment on that is probably close to 150 to 200 thousand dollars. So, so again, those things unfortunately cost, and medicine is is cost costs. Uh, I think the solution to the patients that can't afford the care is the foundation. Um, I um, am very much into thinking of starting the foundation. I do have a lot of patients, grateful patients that that have resources. They they truly have huge resources that like I couldn't even imagine how many how much resources people can have and and uh, the way to do it is to to basically start a, a legitimate foundation where where those people that can fund the foundation can do that and that money can be used to help patients that can't pay for their care but but those patients will have to be like evaluated like this is how foundations work. That, that's how my old hospital foundation worked. There was a charity foundation when the patient couldn't afford the care. The charity will review each case individually and say, yes, you truly do not have the resources and we are going to sponsor your care. So, so this is what I see as a true uh, answer to, to your concerns. Um, I, I feel very bad about the me not being able to take the insurance, but I cannot take the insurance that is pretty much non-existent, meaning not covering the things that I do. They do cover some of the procedures, but they don't cover the, the main procedures that I do. And being a physician, I cannot pick and choose and say that I'll take insurance for, for, for this given procedure and not take it for that procedure. That is illegal. You either take them, you either take insurance for everything or you take insurance for nothing. Yeah. So, so this is my uh, elephant in the room. Uh, this is uh, probably like I again. I said I, I I feel very very bad about it. I feel horrible about it. It's not, but this is the only way I could have um, had my practice open and continue going. But I promise to work on the foundation to be able to find find help for for those uh, patients who who need that help from the foundation. I probably need some help find, starting a foundation, but that's like knowing how to do that uh, i am way too busy uh, yeah, you have a lot going on with the cushion the bike seat the pain pumps yeah, yeah. I, I see yeah. That. now my now my main project and really the most urgent project right now knowing that how great the pain pump works and knowing how um that, that this is probably going to end very soon like the hospital that is doing that i i can see them just pulling the plug Mm -hmm. I have a big emergency trying to figure out where I can get the patients in to get those pain pumps because I would hate to deny that 
fantastic treatment to the patients. Yeah. Well, hopefully um, something works out. <laughs> Wish oh, I could help. <laughs> Cora, something is because it always does. So uh, I, sooner or later, I figure things out. That's how I've been. You know, I think a lot of people know, well, maybe that know about me. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound it like bragging, but and, and a lot of people that know me and know about my practice, we, we have been known that to like constantly push forward with like new treatments that were not like not existent like first doing a pain pump and i'm going to talk about the pain pump i actually have some models of the pain pump to to show you so i will be demonstrating the pain pumps and stuff but first doing those pain pumps for surgical patients reattaching the ligament wrapping the nerve um using the nims monitor which is something i use during surgery to actually um find the nerve and and you know injecting botox in the pelvis i, I was the first uh physician in the United States, not in the world, but in the United States to be injecting Botox into the pelvis in 2003 before anybody else. So, so again, I, I think I'm known for like pushing the boundaries to, to beyond where I, there can be pushed. Uh, so I will never stop. Uh, but the project most urgent right now is figuring the pain pump place and placement and everything. And uh, with that, I am ready for your questions. All right, let's get started. So first, we're going to start um, for those that don't know or maybe are in the process of figuring it out. So pudendal neuralgia is a long-term pelvic pain. It is caused by irritation or damage to the pudendal nerve. So let's first start, um, Dr. Hibner, how do you confirm a PN diagnosis? And is there a diagnostic checklist that you personally use? So um, thank you. That's, that's a great question. It's actually something that comes up very, very often. So I, um, j just to be clear, when I use the word uh, pudendal neuralgia, uh, I, um, what I mean by that is the pain in the area of the pudendal nerve. And that's it. Like That's where the diagnosis ends. Because if you look at the uh, Webster dictionary definition of neuralgia or, or um, any other English language dictionary, neuralgia means the pain in the area of the pudendal nerve. It doesn't just mean that the nerve is injured or anything. It's just the area of the nerve. So, so pudendal neuralgia is a symptom. When the patient comes in and says uh, for female patients, if the pain is in the clitoris, labia, vagina, vulva, rectum, perineum, pudendal neuralgia. And for males, it's in the penis and scrotum and perineum. Uh, pudendal nerve entrapment is when the nerve is actually entrapped in the scar tissue or in the surgical material. In, in my case, it's often a surgical material, but of course, a lot of my patients never had any surgery. They, so, so I think the question that your viewers want to ask, how do you confirm that the, the pudendal nerve is entrapped? And honestly, I um, do not uh, think there's a test that's accurate enough. Um, unfortunately, the resolution of the MRI or MRN it's, uh, is uh, not enough to see the pudendal nerve. The pudendal nerve is just too small. Even those three Tesla MRIs are just not accurate enough to see the pudendal nerve. Um, so I think the diagnosing of the pudendal nerve entrapment, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. And I have a slide, I lecture a lot about pudendal nerve entrapment and pudendal neuralgia, that you basically have to put all the pieces together. And, and I know some people use non-criteria, which are the, the French criteria, which I, I think are, are flawed in many ways. I mean, they were developed by my mentor and Roger Robert, who I you know, admire for, for doing what he did, but I think there's a lot of flaws in pudendal uh, nerve entrapment. Um, I think that the, the biggest thing in my practice is, and I actually want to, I want to create something that's called Phoenix criteria, kind of as a significant modification of the non criteria, make them simpler and, and more uh, relevant to 2023. Um, when Roger Robert was coming with his criteria, there were no at least we didn't know of people that were injured by mesh, or we didn't really know about a lot of things that we know now. Uh, so number one, uh, in my Phoenix criteria, which would be the criteria that I have to validate, but those would be the criteria to, to, to um, establish the pudendal nerve entrapment. Well, number one, 
patients have to have a pain in the pudendal area. So they have to have pudendal neuralgia to have pudendal nerve entrapment. Number two, um, the pain has to be resulting from some traumatic incident, um, meaning it's either one significant trauma, fall, um, uh, uh, athletic injury, um, and we can talk about what those injuries are, but th there's many different injuries. So one significant big injury or multiple repetitive small injuries, like bike riding is a, is a typical example. Childbirth, where, where you get injury to the pudendal nerve from the baby's head coming out of the birth canal, that's like one big significant injury. Bike riding, you ride every day, you, you have multiple trauma. That part is missing from the non-criteria. And I don't think you can have an injury to the pudendal nerve without an injury. I don't think someone can say, I woke up one morning and I had burning in my perineal area, therefore my nerve is entrapped. It didn't just get entrapped overnight. It ha there has to be some force or something that injures the nerve. Um, the, the next thing is that I believe that patients that have a nerve injury, that the pain is predominantly unilateral. Uh, bike riding may be an exception, but, but you know, with those traumas I'm talking about, it is hard to injure the nerves on both sides. They're not that close to each other. And like whatever force or trauma there is, the, the, the injury to the nerve is almost always on one side. I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, careful with patients who have bilateral pain on both sides and who want the surgery for, I'm like, listen, this is not the nerve. We have to figure out what it is. I mean, maybe in some cases, but it's rare that both nerves are injured. The next very, very important thing, majority of patients with uh, pudendal neuralgia, the symptom pudendal neuralgia, have spasm, significant spasm of the pelvic floor muscles. And when you have the spasm of the pelvic floor muscles, when you actually look at the model of the pelvis, this is the model of the pelvis I have here. This is the same model I use when I do telehealth with my patient. If you look at the course of the pudendal nerve right here, this is the sciatic nerve right here. And the, the, the one to the center of it is the pudendal nerve. That, that yellow line here, that's the pudendal nerve. This is the sciatic. As you see, both of those nerves run from underneath the piriformis muscle. When this muscle is spasming, it's going to give you the sciatica symptoms often and the pudendal symptoms. Now, when I turn the pelvis this way a little bit, so you still see the, the, the tailbone here, the coccyx, um, the vagina is here. Those are the sit bones. And you look on the inside of here. So this part on the inside of the sit bone, that part is called the Alcox canal. I know you're all very familiar with Alcox canal. This is like one of those words that every patient knows. So when you look in here on the inside of the sit bone, the pudendal nerve runs through here and it runs through the obturator internus muscle. So the, this muscle is the operator internus muscle, is the same muscle which is inside the pelvis. I know it's very hard to imagine, please take my word for it, that this muscle and this muscle is the same muscle. So what I tell patients is that when the nerve runs through the operator internus muscle and that muscle is spasming, it's going to be putting pressure on the nerve. So you can have all the nervy symptoms, all, all the burning, tingling, et cetera, because the muscle is pressing on the nerve. And you cannot um, establish that the pudendal nerve is injured as long as you have that spasm. So, so in my criteria, the one that I want to create, uh, uh, you have to get rid of the muscle spasm. And, and whether it is physical therapy, whether it's medication, whether it's Botox injections, which I am huge, huge, like, again, I've been doing this for 20 years right now, the Botox injections or the newest thing that we are starting to do in our office next week, which is called Daxify. It's a, it's a botulinum toxin that works for six months. Um, you have to do that first. And only after the muscles are relaxed and, 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 and actually this is what I do. I have a patient with muscle spasm with pudendal pain. Uh, we do physical therapy, Botox injections, and then I send the patient back to the physical therapist. And the physical therapist tells me, you know, the muscles are completely relaxed. And when the patient tells me, well, I still have the same pain, but the therapist tells me muscles are relaxed. This is when I establish that the nerve is most likely injured. And the very last thing in my criteria number five would be, you still need to have a temporary relief of pain. Uh, after the, the block of some kind. It doesn't have to be CT. It just has to be the block that is done properly. Um, because uh, I know this is one of your questions going 
further, yeah. but you know what happens if there is negative negative block. We can talk about it when we get to the question, but but again, this is how I um, this is the jigsaw puzzle. All those informations together, and and so when patient goes through this. And there's a few more things that I may add, like doing the pain pump, doing amniofix, the amniotic cell injection for, for stem cell regeneration. When patients fail all this, that's when I uh, take patients to, to do the pudendal nerve surgery. Now, having said that, when, when I see a brand new patient, maybe less than 10% of patients end up with surgery because I do all these things to, to truly avoid the surgery. But having said that, like in, in June next month, I think I'm doing four or five pudendal nerve decompression surgeries. So there's still patients that end up having that surgery. Okay. Speaking of the nerve question, that's the next one. Um, so if someone has a negative diagnostic block, um, is there any other way um, that it could still be PN? So, or, you know, what would you suggest to that person? Yeah, so we have, you know, the biggest question, and I, I get that all the time, every week, see it in the clinic. When someone has negative pudendal nerve block, I have to ask them about the block because patients say, well, I had a block and I did nothing. And like, when it did nothing doesn't mean that you're, you're back in pain now. So you were better for a few hours and you're back in pain now because patients have this recall bias. They like are back in pain. And does it mean that... Um, you never got out of pain even for a second. And then the third most important question, this is the question that is that very few people ask, were you numb when you had the block? Because patients go and they have a block by maybe a provider that's in their area, but it's not an expert in pudendal nerve blocks. And the doctor says, well, I did the pudendal nerve block, but the patient was never numb. Yeah. Well, what that means is they missed, like they never, numb the nerve yeah the, the only one that counts is that the that the patient is truly numb in the pudendal area and and uh, uh, and they still have pain so when the patient still has pain despite being numb in the pudendal area that's the that's the negative block that's the negative test now there's very few patients like that because often when you're numb you have no pain and that confirms the diagnosis now if you're numb and you still have pain then your pain is not from the pudendal nerve. Then it's coming from some other nerves. Uh, and uh, depending on the area, for example, if it's more like clitoral anterior pain, that could be, and I've had patients like that, that gentofemoral nerve. So I had a patient who um, had the clitoral pain. I did a pudendal nerve block. She was completely numb in that area, like complete numbness, but she, had, she still continued to have pain in her clitoris. So the following day, because we kind of had to let, let the block wear off, I, I did the block of the gentofemoral nerve. And her pain went away after blocking the gentofemoral nerve. So basically what I did later on, like a few days later, I, I went in and I surgically cut the gentofemoral nerve because it's a sensory nerve. Uh, it's a nerve that doesn't move any muscles. You can actually just sever the nerve. It, it took away the pain. She still had sensation in her clitoris from the pudendal nerve. So it's not like I denervated that area, but it took away the pain. So again, if you have truly, truly negative block, but you have to, you have to make sure that you're numb after the block and you still have pain. All right. So you actually already answered the next one. So I'm going to move on to the treatments. Um, so a lot of people have, um, questions about kind of like the do's and don'ts, like what should they avoid as um, new patients? I know you mentioned don't rush into surgery. So first make sure you do the less invasive things like um, PT, Botox, things like that. Um, so what happens um, when those things, so what options are there after the steroid Botox injections for PN are no longer effective? So, so, so let me back out for a second, Cara, I'm sorry. You, you know, so when, when you have a newly, new onset of pudendal pain, and, and those were actually described by Dr. Stanley Antelak, who was one of the original pudendal doctors. He, he's retired, but he's, he's another Polak like us. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, oh, Stan Antelak? Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah. 
uh, he, he was in Minnesota, and but he's retired. He was a urologist at Mayo Clinic. He he basically says that the single most important thing is the avoidance. So like if you got injured riding a bike, you stop. If you got injured um, doing whatever activity, you stop. Uh, of course, if your injury was childbirth, like you can't undo it. You don't want to undo it. You you know of course, uh, but uh, but. Um, if there was an activity that did it, stop doing that activity. And you also have to start protecting your pudendal nerve. So don't do any uh, activities that significantly increase your pain. Like don't sit for, don't force it, don't push it, don't sit for a prolonged time because it only increases your muscle spasm. It only increases the inflammation around the area. So, so the avoidance is number one. Uh, number two, you know, when, and when I lecture about it, I always say if I ever had pudendal neuralgia and someone gave me a choice of, of, of medications, physical therapy, surgery, or injections. And I could only pick one, you know, like one of those games, like pick one and you can't pick anything else. I would always choose physical therapy. Um, uh, this is probably the single most important thing. You need to find a physical therapist in your area that knows what they're doing because bad physical therapy is worse than no physical therapy, that the physical therapy can injure you. So you need to be treated by a physical therapist that is a trained pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, if you don't know how to find them, um, I generally recommend going on the website of Herman and Wallace. Herman and Wallace is the Pelvic Pain Institute out of Seattle. Um, uh, I'm a little biased because I teach for them, but I've only taught for them for a year and they've been around for like 20 or 30 years. So it's not I mean, it's a new thing for me to teach for them. I've recommended them way, way before I even like um, gave lectures for them. But Herman and Wallace is a pelvic pain institute. They, um, uh, most of the physical therapists in the country went through their training. So I encourage you to, uh, if, if you have your physical therapist and you're doing great, please don't go changing the physical therapist. But if you don't how, know how to find one, um, find them on Herman and Wallace website. Um, so please do the physical therapy. Now, the problem that I have with physical therapy, because some physical therapists get so involved that they, you know, after two years, I get a call and I'm like, I'm not making any progress. Can you help? I'm like, two years? That phone call should have come in two months uh, or, or like much sooner than that. Because um, physical therapy, you, you would see the effect sooner. Like you may hit a brick wall, maybe you're not down to zero, but there should be some effect. You don't do physical therapy for two years and then look for help. Remember, the longer you wait, the more difficult it is to treat. The, there are certain time limits that you kind of do not want to go over. So yes, physical therapy, uh, if that fails, the, the medications, the suppositories that I am a big proponent of, the, the Valium Baclofen, Ketamine, Vaginal Rectal Suppositories, great muscle relaxant, great pain medicine for the nerves. And then um, for me, it would either be the Botox injections, which are, um, there's a huge number of patients that get a relief from Botox. I estimate close to 80% of patients may have a relief after Botox or, or the new thing, the Daxify. I'm literally starting doing the Daxify injections next Tuesday. So in four or five days, uh, will probably be the first Daxify injection into the pelvis ever um, happen, happening in my office. Um, and then when that fails, then we go with the pain pumps, with the uh, implantable on cue pain pump. Um, and I can go over the pump. I think there, we'll get to the pump specifically. And, and then I do... Um, uh, 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 injections of amniofix, which are the amniotic membrane cells that are obtained during cesarean sections. They inject them around the nerve. They, um, they actually attract your own body stem cells to the area where they're injected, meaning to the nerve, and they may help the nerve regenerate. And only when the patient fails that, that's when I offer patient surgery. But please do not rush into the surgery until your pelvic floor is not addressed properly. Okay. So then I, I know you touched on this a little bit, uh, but this was a question of ours. Um, if the pudendal nerve is surrounded or trapped in scar tissue, um, what do you believe is the best approach in that situation? Well, if I know, so if I had a magic wand and I knew that there is scar tissue around the nerve, like if the, if the test like this existed, it doesn't exist. So you, you don't know that, but if it existed, the surgery is the only way. Uh, if you, uh, once you have seen the, how dense the scar tissue gets around the nerve, how it, it, it is almost like cement, like 
sometimes you cut it, you have to change the scalpel knife because it gets blunt and you need a new knife. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know there are some people believe that you can inject, you know, hyaluronidase, you can inject like stuff to dissolve the scar tissue. You can't, if, if it's truly a scar tissue, but often you don't know that until you do the surgery. But it, it, if there was a magic test, if you truly have a scar tissue, you have to release the nerve out of the scar tissue. Okay. So in your experience then, um, could pudendal nerve entrapment ever resolve on its own without surgery? I think if it's an entrapment, it will not with few caveats to your questions. Well, number one, we don't know you have an entrapment. The, most of the patients, I, I would say great majority of patients with pudendal pain have muscle spasm. And, and uh, so, so that can resolve. And a lot of patients, like I said, you have the operator internus muscle, you have a pudendal nerve running through it. You have the muscle spasming around it. In a way, it is the entrapment, but it's not scar tissue. It's the muscle spasming. So the treatment for this is not for me to operate on the nerve. The treatment is to relax the muscle. So there are treatments for the muscles that we discussed, but the, the, the muscle spasm can technically resolve on its own. And, and definitely I see patients, I actually saw two patients last week. They said when I made an appointment, two patients in, on Wednesday, when I made an appointment, I was like really, really bad, but they had to wait a little bit for the appointment. They're like, well, I'm actually better. I'm like, well, if you're better then Call me if, when you stop getting better. Right. Uh, when patients are getting better, I am like not doing anything uh, uh, until they call me and say, I'm not getting better anymore. Okay. All right. So let's see. I'm trying to think, because I know we're kind of jumping around a little and answering them as we go here. Should we go to the future treatments? Because I know you have your pump I, there. Um, I am, um, we can talk about whatever, we can talk about the decompression surgery, we can talk about the future treatments. I think, um, you know, I think a lot of, uh, maybe I could talk a little bit about the compression surgery and then. Sure, we can, yeah, we can uh, do that. The, the reason I, actually, I'm sorry, the future, let's talk about the compression surgery and then I'll talk about the future treatments. So, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of you ask about different types of surgeries. Um, again, I actually lecture extensively on that. And as you know, there is different ways to approach the pudendal nerve. Um, the pudendal nerve um, runs, um, so I, one thing I forgot to mention that I also teach anatomy at the University of Arizona Medical School. So I teach anatomy to medical students. So um, it actually gives me a lot of opportunity to do a lot of like dissections when, when the students are gone from the cadaver lab, I am able to like try to figure out things and understand how they work. And, and when you actually historically look at the surgeons, how they functioned and or learned in the 19th century, um, like, you know, our forefathers of surgery, they were all anatomists because you, you had to figure out things. The pudendal nerve runs underneath this muscle. This is the levator muscle. That's where the pudendal nerve runs. So uh, I know some people are trying to approach the pudendal nerve laparoscopically from here, but the pudendal nerve is covered by those muscles here. So in order to get to that nerve, you actually have to cut through the levator muscle. Um, so initially when I went to France to work with Roger Robert, I was... Um, my intention is to do the robotic Da Vinci nerve decompression because I am a robotic surgeon by training. But then I realized that in order for me to get to the nerve, that it's covered by this muscle and I would have to cut through this muscle to get to the nerve because the nerve is on this side. This is what the nerve is. Um, so that's why I can do the laparoscopic and robotic surgery. Uh, but I think the area of the nerve that is decompressed is just much smaller than, than what you'd get with transgluteal approach. Um, there was another approach that was called transition rectal, where you actually went into the vagina and it was in a way a blind surgery. You'd made an incision and with your finger, try to like stretch the adhesions. Um, you didn't really see the nerve very well. And that was one of the problems. And most of the people that did transition rectal surgery stopped doing this. Uh, the very first original pudendal nerve decompression surgery before even Roger Robert was something called transpare anal surgery, where you made the incision around the anus right here. And again, blindly get to the nerve like this. 
Uh, that was invented by Dr. Ahmed Shafiq, the uh, colorectal surgeon from Egypt. Um, again, it was the blind surgery. So the surgery that I learned and the surgery that I still performed, except I significantly modified that surgery, is the transgluteal surgery, where you actually make, uh, make the incision on the buttock. So the patient is laying on her or, or his belly for the surgery, and the incision goes on the buttock, and you try to make it right over this ligament here, the sacral tuberous ligament. When you make the incision over the sacred tuberous ligament, you get to the ligament and then I cut the ligament kind of in a Z fashion. It allows me to open it all the way, like, like opening the book. And when I do that, I get access to the pudendal nerve pretty much all the way from here to pretty much all the way through here because that ligament is all open. So I can actually decompress the, the very large part of the nerve. Um, and one of my uh, first modifications of the surgery was to actually re restart reattaching this ligament because that's the original Roger Robert surgery did not reattach the ligament. That, that's what I started doing to provide the stability to this joint, which is the sacroiliac joint here. Um, uh, I then started putting the pain pump in. So the on cue pain pump has been on the market forever, but almost from the very beginning, I started using this device called on cue pain pump. It is a balloon, which is filled with a, with a local anesthetic. In this case, well, in this case, it's water because it's sample, but, but we fill it with marking. Um, and patient gets a little tiny cut there like this. I don't know if you can see that. So in surgery, from the very beginning, I was placing this cut there when this area was, when it, the air is completely open right next to the nerve. And that drips the local anesthetic on the nerve right here. And if you can see that very well, mm -hmm. that drips the local anesthetic on the nerve uh, for about three weeks. It basically keeps the area now and patients don't have pudendal pain or have minimal pudendal pain. But more importantly, it helps the brain, the central nervous system, forget the pain in, in that area. It's called central sensitization, it's the centralized pain. Um, and, and so that was a big, big modification that I made to the surgery. Um, and uh, uh, this is actually the very same pump and this very same catheter that we place with the CT scanner right now. So I had to try to reverse that centralized pain without doing the surgery. Uh, and, and we started doing it in January. So this is brand new. I don't know why it took me 18 years to come up with that idea. It was actually my idea to place it with a CT, but I had to find the right radiologist that would be like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> um, and so we formed the team doing this. The next thing that I do is I also wrap the nerve. So that entire nerve is wrapped and I use different wraps. So those are the so-called nerve conduits or wraps that I, 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 I um, protect the nerve from rescarring. That's number one. So it's, it's, like a, it's like a rigid tubing in which you put the nerve and it runs through that rigid tubing. So the scar tissue can't get to that. Um, but, uh, but the second thing that I do, I also put the amniotic membrane. So that's that fetal membrane at which the fetus grows during pregnancy. And there's company that gets them during cesarean sections. I rub the nerve in that fetal membrane and you know, the fetal membrane is all the goodness. I mean, I know that's not a medical term, but uh, medically it has all the nerve growth factors, epithelial growth factors, mm -hmm. et cetera. They attract your own body stem cells to the area to promote the regeneration of the nerve. And so that's the reason why I do the transgluteal surgery. It is much more involved. Patients take longer to recover. Um, although I have patients a few weeks after surgery that are back to work and sitting, but that's not usual. Um, um, I estimate that about two thirds of the patients have benefit from surgery. I'm not saying they're pain-free, but they do benefit from surgery. They, they're saying, you know, I, I, I'm good. Um, like for example, recently a gentleman, um, send me a message that he was spending 22 hours in bed a day without getting out of bed. And now he's, you know, walking around the house and slowly getting better. He's a few months from surgery. And I assume that, you know, I think he will continue to get better, but like for him, that's already a success. Like he's not looking to, to go bike riding or, or ski jumping, you know, or snowboarding. He, he's actually happy at this moment. So I never over promise that you're going to be back to normal, like before your injury but the surgery makes uh, two thirds of the patients better. Okay. The transgluteal surgery. And are, since, cause I know that was another question on here. We talked about the statistics, you said two thirds. Um, are there any side effects for your patients with transgluteal 
Uh, so I estimate that between one and 2% of patients may actually get worse, um, uh, but I think that number has gone down since I am much more careful who I offer the surgery. Uh, you know, over the years I have learned. So um, because um, I go through all the hoops or I have the patient go through all the hoops of like working on the pelvic floor, doing the Botox, doing the nerve blocks, doing the pain pumps, um, I really... I think at this point, I really end up operating on the patients who have a true nerve compression, not just the people that maybe had muscle spasm or something else. Because I think in the past, in my hands, and I think in a lot of surgeons' hands, there are people that probably didn't need the surgery in the first place. So uh, uh, I think I still, that's on our consent, I still warn the patients one to 2% of the risk of getting worse. Um, the other complication that used to be common that is completely eliminated now is that because that incision um, on the during the pudendal surgery, as you see, it goes here. And this, this is the anus right here and the vagina right here. You're kind of close to those organs. So uh, I've had about maybe 10% of patients that would get infected and they could like develop an abscess here because of the proximity. Um, and... and uh, uh, right now, I use something that's called a, the, it's a suction dressing like a wound vac. It's um, the dressing that's under a suction for a few days, pretty much eliminated the infections to the wound. That, that was another modification that I that I came up with. Um, it, it doesn't affect the outcomes of the surgery, but it affects the fact that the patient doesn't have an abscess and healing from the abscess, which is pretty bad. Okay. All right. So. Have you ever had, have you ever done a decompression surgery where you found the nerve was not entrapped? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, and, uh, but you know what, interestingly, and I actually tell patients that I, I tell patients that I've actually had patients where I didn't find the nerve very entrapped and they still got better. And I, I think what it is, is that Sometimes the nerve is entrapped with the scar tissue, but sometimes patients just have very tight space between sacred tubers and sacred spinous ligaments. So as, as you know, we, we didn't go much into the anatomy, but, but the nerve on this side, this side has a nerve model, this side doesn't, but there's two ligaments actually. I only mentioned sacred tubers, but there's a sacred spinous ligament and the nerve runs between those two ligaments. And sometimes you actually don't see the scar tissue, but that space is so tight that that's what's compressing the nerve. And because in surgery, I actually cut this lower ligament, the sacrospinous ligament is gone. Like that doesn't serve a purpose. I cut it, I don't repair it. It just increases the space to the nerve. So it's not necessarily taking the scar tissue out, but it's just making more room for the nerve and putting that nerve conduit. So yes, I have found when the nerve is not compressed, but yes, there are patients among those patients that actually got better. Interesting, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so then we have, a. well, we just talked about it a little bit. So after decompression surgery, they asked it, is it possible to go back in and attach the sacrotuberous ligament? Um, or is there no point in repairing it? I guess. So, so I always on every, since patient number one. So when I, um, learned the surgeon in France uh, that they did not attach their ligament, but I felt that it needed to be attached. Luckily, my uncle, no, my father-in-law, but, uh, but my uncle are orthopedic surgeons. So I basically called my uncle and I'm like, listen, how do you fix the ligament? And so he basically told me. And so with my very first patient, I would repair the ligament, uh, uh, instructed by my orthopedic surgeon uncle. Uh, and, um, the big benefit of that is that if you leave the ligament cut and you don't repair it, it causes the instability to sacroiliac joint. This is the joint here because that ligament, that ligament uh, uh, um, provides stability to the joint. So on all my patients, the joint, the ligament was always repaired. Um, and I've worked with a physical therapist, Loretta, in the past, who actually would tell me that she can feel a difference in the stability of the joint between my patients and those where the when somebody else did the surgery where the ligament was not attached. That, that was by my physical therapist. Now, having said that, I have re-operated on the patients that who had um, uh, the ligament cut and not repaired. 
So when I, and I've done that maybe about 20 times now, when I find that and I find the edges of the cut ligament, when, when I can still see the upper and the lower edge of the ligament, meaning that the ligament is cut, but I can still see this edge and that edge during the surgery. I take what's called cadaveric Achilles tendon. So that's something that the, the, the hospital, not the hospital, but the medical company gets from the cadavers, the Achilles tendon, the one in your heel. And I basically sew in the Achilles tendon in here to reconstruct the ligament. So I have reconstructed those ligaments on the patients where the ligament was cut and left unattached. Okay. All right. Um, so I did skip one because this is this is a very kind of more personal, I think, uh, question. But for patients considering getting surgery with you, um, how long should they plan to stay in Arizona? Is there a follow-up visit for those patients in person? So, you know, the nice thing about uh, not working for my previous institution is that in a way I do make the rules. So the, uh, we, the rule is that we see most of the patients through telehealth and a lot of things before the visit, before the surgery can be done through telehealth. So I don't require patients to travel here. I try to get as much, um, and I actually get most of the information by talking to the patient. Uh, we, we of course see them in the office like a day or two before the surgery, but this is done through telehealth. The, all the follow-ups I drew through telehealth. Generally, generally we try to schedule those surgeries on Mondays. And when the surgery is done Monday, on Monday, uh, patients usually come to the office on Thursday to have that suction dressing removed, the one that I talked about, the one that decreases the risk of infection. And they still have their pain pump um, that is placed by the pudendal nerve. So a lot of patients fly home by Friday. So we do the surgery on Monday, meaning they probably need to come like before the weekend to be like seen in the office and sign the consents and do the exam. Uh, do the surgery on Monday. By Thursday, we remove the pain pump and the patients fly by Friday. And that's actually a good time to fly because those patients have a pain pump in. So they, they may have a pain in their buttock from the incision on the buttock, but usually the pudendal pain is very minimal. Um, I actually have a patient, I uh, have a patient's permission to show it, but like it would be hard for me to show on the phone that I have a patient came to the office four days after surgery to remove the pain pump and she was like walking and she had her boots on and dress and like, you know, none of what some people imagine, like the, the, the walker or the cane, none of that. She just walked. I mean, her husband was helping her walk, but she said she's, she's doing great. So, so um, I either encourage patients to fly Monday, Friday, because when the pain pump is in and if they don't, if they don't do that, then you're probably better off staying longer and then uh, either fly where the pain pump is in or, or just stay here and recover and then fly after three weeks. Right. All right. And then we have one more under there. Let's see. Um, for can pelvic instability after decompression surgery lead to pubis? Is it astitis? Correct me. Uh, pubic astitis. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, like I said, because I've always been attaching the ligament and um, this is what my therapist tells me. There, there's no good way to actually measure pelvic uh, the sacroiliac joint instability. There's really no device that measures it on x-ray. So that's what the physical therapist tells you. So, uh, at least by my physical therapist, none of my patients where the ligament was attached developed the instability of the joint. Mm -hmm. They may have, have had the instability of the joint going in, but they didn't develop from that surgery. Okay. But yes, if you have instability or if you have had surgery where it was cut and left cut, um, et cetera, then yes, absolutely. It may because it makes the whole pelvis unstable. The worst thing it actually does is when your pelvis is unstable is actually it activates your muscles and it's making your muscles spasm because now the muscles are trying to stabilize the pelvis. So when you have instability of the pelvis, all those pelvic floor muscles that, we, that we've talked about, all those muscles are now working to stabilize this joint. So you actually may cause more muscle spasm because you've make the pelvis unstable. And that's why it is so important to reattach that ligament. Okay. So now would you like to 
go back and talk about the future ones or would you like to yeah, talk, about... Let's talk about future treatments? I just wanted to talk about current treatments before I talk okay. about future treatments. That's right. The reason why, no, the reason why I ask is because we also have a section on radio pulse frequency and cryoablation. Um, we had a few people curious about the difference between these and if you even suggest these as a form of treatment for your patients. Okay, so let's talk about the radio frequency and cryoablation, and then we'll talk about the future treatments. So uh, when I was in my private practice at St. Joe's, we actually used to do both. Um, uh, the radiologist that I work with, uh, it's actually the same person that worked with me at St. Joe's that left who I'm working with right now. He didn't leave because I left, but it just happened that way that we reunited on, on the other side, so to say. Um, um, we stopped doing radio frequency ablations because uh, we've actually seen a lot of patients that got irritated or maybe getting even worse with radio frequency ablation. So what radio frequency ablation is, it's a needle that is placed by the pudendal nerve and the tip of the nerve has a radio frequency element, which is the same element that your microwave oven in your kitchen has. And it heats up the nerve and because it's pulsed, it's not the continuous heat like you would do for a, a, a tumor. Like if someone has a, a, a cancer of the liver, you put the needle and you heat it up to destroy it. In this case, it heats up and cools down. And the thinking is that that heating and cooling, um, well, there's really no good explanation how it works, but it seems that it like slightly injures the outside cells of the, of the nerve or the layer of the nerve, and it's kind of forcing it to regenerate. Um, cryoablation is the same concept, except the needle that there's a liquid nitrogen that, that goes to the needle, so you freeze the nerve instead of heating it. Um, I personally, uh, we, we, we at some point st stopped doing the cryoablations too, because I personally did not really see that many patients with that great outcomes of those two procedures. Now, having said that, and I've talked to the Dr. Duarte, the radiologist that I worked with um, last week, that once we have the pain pump in and going and that whole process figured out like in a new place, uh, that I think there'll be a great benefit of doing either radio or cryoablation and then following it with a pain pump. Because what happens is if you actually irritate the patient with the procedure, you cause more muscle spasm, more, more centralized pain, that, that memory of pain in your central nervous system. So I think it may be beneficial to do those procedures where they can be followed by the immediate placement of the pain pump and basically to keep you numb. Uh, but honestly, I mean, this is one of those procedures that I, my people have been doing, my radiologists have been doing and kind of abandoned it because I, I, I don't think it's as good as other treatments. Okay. Um, let's see. I know we're kind of skipping around, so I just want to make sure. Sorry, Cara, uh, I, kind of, I kind of messed up. I but. <laughs> Oh no, I think we're good. I just want to make sure that we're we're kind of hitting all the points, so to speak. Um, so real quick, because I know we talked about this earlier. Um, what are your feelings on spinal and sacral stimulators? So um, I think it's a good procedure. I think it's a procedure that is uh, that should be done last. Meaning, if you can fix the problem, you fix the problem. If you can't fix the problem then either do a DR, dorsal root ganglion stimulator, spinal cord stimulator, but, but that should really come as a last procedure. So, uh, I mean, there are patients who I was not able to help, and there are patients in whom I recommended the spinal cord stimulator or dorsal root ganglion stimulator. Uh, but I, I don't do those procedures. Um, no one that's like personally affiliated with my practice does those procedures. So I basically, refer patients to the pain management and they do the procedure. Okay. Uh, so the feeling is positive, but I think it should be the last resort. Okay. All right. So let's go back to, um, let's see, I'm trying to think if we missed anything else. Future, future treatments. Yep. Let's, let's do future treatments. So um, again, um, you know, I, I, so I think, I mean, I, I think that's the, the general feeling that my practice has, has been known for coming up with future treatments. Um, I, uh, uh, 
really think that 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 pain pump uh, that we were talking is is a great treatment um, because now once the catheter is placed next to the pudendal nerve, it not only allows me to to run the local anesthetic for as long as I want to, but I can use it for other things. And just to give you an example, I have a patient. This is a, a patient I communicated with this morning. Uh, who um, he, when he had a pudendal nerve block, he had a great pain relief, but when the pain pump went in, he still had a pain relief, but it wasn't as good as with the nerve block. So I assumed that maybe he has some scar tissue around the nerve where when he gets a big bolus, like big volume with an injection, he gets the effect, but when the pain pump is going drip, 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 like really slow, uh, that there's some kind of a scar tissue that's preventing the medication to get to the nerve. So this gentleman lives in Phoenix. So, and he's like a very um, open to trying things. Um, I mean, I don't want it to sound like we're experimenting, but you know, this is a field that is so unknown that in a way you try to do things. So, so he came to the office on Monday, uh, five days ago. And what I did is I assume that if there's a scar tissue, maybe if I push like the huge amount of fluid through the catheter that's already in, I already have a catheter, I, you know, I don't, then maybe that volume will like stretch some tissues. So I injected uh, 25 milliliters of solution on each side. It was mostly saline with little lidocaine in it. I mean, I can't inject that much lidocaine, it would be toxic. So it was very, very, very dilute solution of lidocaine on each side. Uh, basically to stretch the Alcox canal, to stretch the area around the pedendal nerve. And this morning I got the message from him that his pain that is down to one. I mean, wow. so, so, so the fact that we can place though, that Dr. Duarte can place those, Dr. Duarte can place those catheters uh, uh, precisely around the nerve. And I can do things like that, inject local anesthetic, maybe inject the steroid maybe inject the, the high volume of fluid for, for just mechanical stretching um, is, is great. I think that's one of the futures uh, of the treatment. Um, I think that all kinds of stem cell, amniotic cell regeneration, I, you know, I've had, um, I've been doing those injections of amniofix, the amniotic cells. Um, unfortunately, they're off the market. We, we still have few remaining boxes in the office, but it's a long story. I would have to spend a long time talking about it, but but uh, I have to find another source of that. But the point is that that about fifty percent of patients had some relief of the injecting amniotic cells just for regeneration. So, um, you know, having said that, there is still a lot of patients who will end up with surgery because you know if you had mesh, if you had a mesh injury, if you had a stitch around the nerve, if you've had um, if you have a, such a dense scar tissue that like you're injecting, you can't even push the flu fluid through, you have to cut it with a, with a knife. Um, I know a lot of patients are afraid of surgery because they hear the horror stories, but um, very often what I hear when I do the surgery, and maybe it's because I place the pain pump, but the patient comes to the office and it's like, this is it? Like, that, that's what I was afraid of? Um, you know, um, one question there, because I kind of maybe didn't want to miss that. Uh, there's a question about like, what's new about PGAD? Um, yeah. So persistent genital arousal disorder, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's um, probably one of the most debilitating symptoms in patients with pudendal neuralgia, uh, at least from my experience, uh, seeing patients for many years for, with PGAD, um, I see that those patients are probably the most affected. Yes. Uh, what I'm finding that a lot of these patients have engorgement of the clitoral veins around the clitoris. Uh, you can actually see it on the specific ultrasound. You, you can't see it on like regular ultrasound or regular MRI, but you see it on the very specific ultrasound that, that I do, uh, where you see this like very, very engorged vein running on the clitoral nerve. And then during like the, and that vein is going to constantly rub on that nerve and give you that constant clitoral p-gut stimulation and even worse with like sexual um, uh, excitement when the veins get even more engorged there will be like even more more pressure so what i have been doing for those patients with um, 
you know, some success. I mean, I, I actually didn't keep a very good statistics on it, but but definitely success in, in some patients is that I do the sclerotization of that vein. So under sedation, under anesthesia, I place the needle into the engorged clitoral vein and I inject um, a substance, the same substance that, that, the, that the surgeons use on leg varicosities. It's, it's called sotradecal. And I basically uh, sclerose that vein, meaning make the vein go away. It takes a few weeks for the, like, it doesn't happen right away. So the patients are actually like slightly worse for a few weeks. But then when the vein sclerosis and the pressure is taken off the nerve, then there is definitely a relief of symptoms in some patients. Okay. All right. Let's see. Trying to go down, see if we missed anything. So I have a, I have a few miscellaneous questions. Um, so we have, um, I know one gentleman asked, what do you think of a patient getting their entire uh, piriformis muscle removed? I am very, very opposed to that. I remember working with my physical therapist, Loretta, uh, who was very opposed to that. It causes the instability to the entire pelvis and it only makes things worse. I, I kind of mentioned that at the beginning, but the piriformis muscle, which is this muscle, well, number one, it's your, it's your, hip rotator muscle, it goes to your hip. If, if you remove the piriformis, your obturator internus muscle takes over. So now you're causing the more problem with this muscle. But the reason why uh, patients may have a suggestion of removing the piriformis, because again, when this is in spasm, it's compressing your pudendal nerve. It's right here, you see this. This is the piriformis yeah. muscle that goes to the hip out here. This is your pudendal nerve. This is your sciatic nerve. Instead of removing this muscle, inject it with Botox. Um, I've injected two patients with Botox piriformis yesterday, just in one day. And that is very, very effective. When you inject Botox and you relax the muscle, you don't remove it, you relax the muscle, it, it, uh, it takes the pressure off. But if you remove the muscle, it will cause the instability to that entire hip joint and, and it may only worsen your problems. So please, please, please do not remove your piriformis muscles. Whatever you do, uh, please do not remove your piriformis muscles. Okay. Um, what about, um, let's see, is the pudendal nerve responsible for fecal incontinence? So Ahmed Shafiq, who I mentioned initially, uh, the first surgeon that did those surgeries, he was a colorectal surgeon. So he initially, his first patients were like surgeries were done for incontinence. But, you know, a lot of times when patients have fecal incontinence, the question is, is it because the sphincter is not working and you're just leaking stool? Or do you have like fecal urgency, meaning like you feel like you have to go and you like can't hold it? If you have to go and can hold it, like you have the urgency type of symptoms, it's it's generally a pelvic floor dysfunction. So it's more like the muscle thing. To have fetal incontinence because your sphincter is not squeezing, you would have to have injury on both sides of the nerves. I mean, is it possible? Yes, it's unlikely um, uh, to injure both sides of the nerve because usually if you still have one side and the sphincter is squeezing on one side, that is generally enough to provide you with enough force to, to hold it. So, so the question to ask is what type of incontinence, the urgency type or the fact that you're just constantly leaking? Okay. Um, let's see. If one, okay. If one has central sensitization, is the treatment that you provide different to those who don't? So I think central sensitization is, the central topic we should be talking about. Um, because uh, when patients have chronic pain for some time, there's this phenomenon called central sensitization. And the easiest way for me to, to explain it, it's like the memory of pain in the central nervous system, like, like almost like a complex regional pain syndrome, a reflex sympathetic dystrophy, like many names to really one thing that is happening. And you absolutely need to address that central sensitization because you can be fixing the nerve, you can be doing other things. Unfortunately, uh, um, uh, th that memory remains. 
So the, the treatments that I do and we do is number one, you want to block the nerve for as long as you can to like take away the original source of pain. This is where I think the pain pump is great. And I, you know, and I tell patients that uh, I've told patients that we'll do the pain pump. And even if it doesn't provide you with the long-term relief, and even if you end up having surgery, we're kind of down regulating your central nervous system. But, but the other thing that I, I mean, other, you know, physical therapy is important, but the other thing that I routinely do, and that's on the first visit, every one of my patients gets the suppositories that have ketamine. So ketamine is a medication that is an MDA receptor modulator, which is the receptor in the spinal cord, which is partially responsible for that. Um, it's like great for the patients that have like hypersensitivity to touch, like uh, people that can't wear underwear or the seams on their underwear are irritating, or they have to wear like um, loose baggy pants or long dresses and because anything that touches in that area. So that's allodynia. That's like one of the symptoms of that. And that's where ketamine suppositories are, are helpful or ketamine in any way, but I use it as the suppository. Okay. And we had a question from a lady who actually got PN, um, from childbirth. Um, and she was curious if she gets pregnant again, um, could it make her PN worse? So um, what I would recommend for patients like that is if this was in, not the pregnancy itself, because during the pregnancy, the baby's head comes in the pelvis and it may actually compress that area and present of just, just the pregnancy, but that's rare. It's, it's much more common during the actual vaginal childbirth. Uh, because as the baby heads comes out, it like really crushes, or, or it may, I'm sorry, not really, it doesn't, very few patients, but it may crush the nerve here. So so when patients do get pregnant again, and they already have pedendal neuralgia, I would strongly, strongly recommend doing cesarean section, not to, not to re-injure the nerve. Very strongly recommend, and not like go into labor and do the cesarean section, but basically talk to your obstetrician and say, hey, we need to plan my cesarean section because before my contractions begin, like once the baby is mature enough to be delivered, but before I go into labor. Okay. Um, so I had another member who says, so we all know kind of it's hard to sit with PN, but why would, why could it be possible for someone to also be in pain while standing with PN? When you're standing, um, when you're standing, when you're walking, especially actually what I am uh, noticing more and more is patients saying walking on the incline more than flat surface or decline, but any of it, you, you actually use your pelvic floor muscles to stabilize your body. Uh, again, it's the most pronounced when you're walking on the incline because you're using your piriformis, your operator internus, your glutes. So it just puts more pressure on that area here. Um, uh, patients are most comfortable laying down, but, but, but yes, traditionally we say sitting is the worst and standing laying down is better. And, uh, but it really depends how you stand and what muscles do you use to stabilize your body when you're standing. But that same person, if that person is listening, just see if you actually have more pain walking on the incline than flat surface or decline, because that's one of the common themes is walking up, you know, up the hill on the incline. Interesting. Okay. Um, and now, so this one is interesting because I've actually gotten this question a lot and I've actually even wondered about this myself. Um, why would a fluoroscopy guided nerve block uh, leave someone in more pain? So, um, again, as far as the nerve block, I, I let, let's talk first about the effectiveness of the nerve block and then the, your, that specific case. When patients get nerve blocks, I honestly don't think it matters how it's done as long as it's done properly. Meaning if you are numb after the nerve block, whether it's done fluoroscopy, ultrasound, CT, MRI, or, or unguided transvaginal, um, if the patient after the block says, I'm like really numb, then it was a correct nerve block and it doesn't matter how the nerve was found. Um, but there are patients who actually have worsening of the pain after the nerve block. And sometimes it is because of what is injected. For example, Canalog, one of the steroids has little particles in it. And, and that by itself is known to, well, it, it may help with the nerve pain because it decreases the inflammation, but those little particles may actually irritate 
the, the area of the nerve. And that usually goes away. So it's not like someone is permanently will be in more pain, but like maybe a few weeks of pain. And it, but that's not because it was done through fluoroscopy. It was like what was injected in it. Okay. But you also have to remember that, uh, and actually I think our interview is going great because we're following from one topic to another. We just talked about the central sensitization. So most of the patients with pudendal neuralgia that has been going on for some time have this central sensitization, meaning they're so hypersensitized that like whatever is done to them, like, is going to increase the uh, the pain. It, it is just that patients are so hypersensitive. So the fluoroscopy uh, nerve block, probably done without any anesthesia. And so your muscles are already spasming, they're already hypersensitive. And now you take a needle and you push it and you look on the fluoroscopy, you push it and it, it is just going to irritate the surrounding muscles. I think what your uh, patient was trying to ask, is it possible that they hit the nerve and that damaged the nerve with a needle? Uh, you know, I'm sorry, but when you do that for 20 years, you know what the real question is. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to sound arrogant, but-, but <laughs> No, I, I just, no, but I, I mean, that's also the, fair, yeah. I know, what, I know where the question is. So the question is like, because it was done with fluoroscopy, was it less accurate? And is it possible that they hit the nerve? Um, we don't see the nerve uh, on any of those, whether it's on CT, unguided, ultrasound, or fluoroscopy. So, um, but I don't have any evidence to prove that you actually hit the nerve with a needle. I, I do not have any evidence that with any of the ways you hit the nerve. And I don't have any evidence that even if you did, that this actually would cause prolonged pain. Um, I don't have a single evidence of a single patient where actually the needle the, the needle directly hit the nerve and it injured the nerve. Now, having said that, most of the blocks that I do, um, and they're not mostly diagnostic, I do them for the reason of like injecting Botox. Because when I inject Botox, I do it under sedation, under anesthesia, plus I do the nerve block. And the nerve block is not to treat the nerve. The nerve block is so when the patient wakes up from the procedure, I want the patient to be numb for several hours because of that irritation. I do those unguided through the vagina uh, by feel. Um, and I think in my hands, they're actually maybe the most accurate because, you know, when, when you do like thousands of those, I probably get the nerve block in about 98% of the cases. Like I actually counted that statistic some time ago, but I have the benefit that I generally do them when the patient's anesthetized because for the Botox, patient goes in the room, I examine the patient, then the patient goes under anesthesia. And then I do the nerve block when the patient is sleeping. So I don't really activate any of the muscles because the patient can't feel me doing the nerve block. Okay. All right, let's see. We kind of talked, it's funny because we, we kind of touch on all of these. So um, do you believe that people who have both uncommon and severe neuropathy, such as neuropathy pain in the upper legs, can that start to irritate the pudendal nerve? Well, I, I think that there's a lot of patients that have a lot of other symptoms outside of the pelvis. And that's actually very common. I mean, you know, if they have neuropathy elsewhere. I think it's, it's worth looking into like, is there any common nerve issue, which wouldn't be me, I'm not a neurologist, but, but that's definitely uh, what it is. If, if it started in the pelvis and then it spread to other parts, like, is it that central sensitization? Like basically the, the central nervous system is so fired up in a way that everything else is irritated. And, you know, um, the, there are neural connections in the spinal cord that go up and down. So like the sciatic nerve is always uh, often irritated. There's almost always lower back pain. Um, but you, you see some commonalities. For example, patients who have um, pelvic floor muscle spasm tend to have TMJ, temporal, temporal mandibular joint muscle spasm, the muscle spasm of those muscles. So, so there is something genetic where those patients actually um, uh, are mostly predisposed to that. I mean, you, you still treat them, but for someone like that, like people with like severe neuropathy everywhere else, 
I really would think what that pay, and this is really what where my practice is going. I mean, this is going to be the next step if I logistically figure it out, is that I would want a patient like that if there's muscle spasm in the pelvis to inject the Botox and before the patient even wakes up from anesthesia, basically roll a patient to a CT scanner and, and put those pain pumps that I showed you and basically keep the pelvis numb for like a month or two months to, to completely downregulate the, the source from the pelvis and see if other neuropathies may get better because you took away the, the, the original offending factor. Okay. Let's see. Should we go to the last one then? Uh, we can do the labral tears and the last one, of course. Okay. So for patients with weak hip stabilizers or labial tears, is the answer to strengthen the um, hips to stabilize them? So, so the labrum on the hip is the ligament that goes around the hip here, hip joint. This is the socket for the hip, uh, for the femur, for the femoral bone. And so it's like there's a band of thick tissue that helps to, to, to keep it stable. And when that labrum is torn, then the muscles, the piriformis, the obturator internus, so this is the obturator internus muscle, this is the piriformis muscles, and other muscles, they, they work to stabilize that hip. And this causes the hypertonicity of the obturator internus muscle, which again, puts the pressure on the pudendal nerve. So that's why people with labral tears have pudendal symptoms. Um, but I think in those patients, strengthening the muscle would can only make it worse because they're already hypertonic trying to stabilize that joint. I think in patients with labral tears, the, the, the treatment should be to fix the labral tear. Okay. All right. Let's see, a common struggle for PN patients, as you well know, is that very few doctors are knowledgeable about PN and capable of treating it. Do you have any suggestions on how to get more medical establishments to educate their future doctors about PN, PNE, PGAD? And that way, you know, patients can get a faster diagnosis and hopefully better care. So, so how much time do you have for that answer? I know, right? <laughs> Um, so I started seeing PN patients in 2003. I work for two medical schools, Creighton University Medical School, where I'm actually a full professor of Creighton. I work for University of Arizona Medical School, I, Arizona State University, College of Healthcare Innovation, Mayo Clinic. Um, I teach at all those universities. I, um, I was a board member of um, uh, um, AAGL, American Academy of Gynecological Laparoscopists, and I actually founded their special pelvic pain interest group, which didn't exist. Um, I uh, taught 14 fellows, which is the higher level of education than residents, and, and probably hundreds of residents, like several hundred residents and 14 fellows. Um, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is none of those people have ever, have ever heard of pudendal neuralgia, and neither did I in 2003 before I Googled it. I, I literally Googled the symptoms and that's how I learned the name. Um, I have a feeling that I have a, I personally have put a big dent in it because of all the people that I educated. So now I have residents uh, that, that I trained that they know very little about it, but when they have patients with that symptoms, they're like, mm, I remember that guy Hibner, he like was my attending and, and this is, I think, what he was doing. And, and all of them have my number because I, all my former residents have my number. And then I get a phone call and they're like, hey, I have this patient. Um, I still, I personally try to push it. I give a lot of lectures to physical therapists mostly because I think physical therapists, pelvic floor physical therapists should be your contact people. I don't think it should be the physicians. I think it should be pelvic floor physical therapists. They're much more educated in that field. Um, and... Uh, I think we're making the progress. But like I said, I spent 17 years in teaching two medical schools, a big, big residency in Phoenix, a fellowship that I started, multiple societies, hundreds of lectures that I've given. Uh, definitely, I made a big dent. I feel that because I have people like contacting me. Um, uh, I, one of the evidence that, uh, that, that, 
there is a dent, I don't know if my dent, but there is a dent, that we finally have ICD-10 codes. So there's something that's called International Classification of Diseases, where the, the, each disease has its like coding number that goes to the billers and coders. Um, and uh, 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 so finally there's a code, like before there was not even a code for the disease. So uh, the knowledge is spreading. The, the problem is, and I mentioned that, uh, I said I won't talk about it again, but I have to say it. Be out of the people that I have trained, out of the 14 fellows, when they went into the practice, a lot of times their hospitals, when they hear that they want to be doing the procedures that are not covered, the hospitals are like, no way, no way. You, you, you're here to do endometriosis surgery. You're here to do hysterectomies. You're not here to do that. Um, so the barriers are not only, you know, the barriers are not only in people's knowledge, because in my initial barrier in 2003, when I came back from France, uh, I had colleague physicians that like at conferences were looking at me, like almost pointing me out with a finger saying, look, this is this crazy guy that is operating on the nerves and basically uh, making fun of me. No one is laughing anymore, but at least I made that progress. But now the issue is the insurance companies that completely don't recognize that, completely. So yes, you can train the people, but they will start practicing it. And then they'll be like, you know what? I'm going back to doing endometriosis surgery. And, and that's the big barrier. It's not something I can overcome by myself. I mean, I know there's other providers in the country, you know, Mark Conway, who I'm personally friends with. I, you know, I think he's a great guy. Uh, uh, and, and several others, you know, Mario Castellanos, who was my fellow, who I trained, and I thought he he's the best of the best. And unfortunately, his uh, his um, practice, his life took him some some other ways. Uh, but but yes, the, there are uh, uh, it's a hard battle. I was counting that the fourteen people that I trained will be doing it, and so. I, I feel uh, personally, me, Michael Hebner, I feel that I've done all I could. Uh, right now, my uh, I'm concentrating on the patient care uh, because I'm a solo practitioner. It's just me. There's no one else other than me in my practice and my physical therapists. Uh, I'm concentrating on getting this uh, pain pump uh, program going. I'm concentrating on doing... Uh, surgeries when they need it, um, doing Botox and Daxify, the, again, the new formulation of Botox. I'm concentrating on, on building the, the seat support for, for your um, members that will be able to cool down their uh, uh, pudendal area when they sit, uh, which I think will be important, and a few other things. Uh, I, I can't talk to the legislature uh, in Washington, D.C., or anybody who can change the how, how insurance companies work. Remember that insurance companies actually go off Medicare rules. So even though your, your, your members, some have Medicare, but some may not have Medicare, but most of the big insurance companies, United, Blue Cross, they still follow what Medicare does. So basically uh, to change that would be uh, going to Medicare and having Medicare change it, which is like impossible, impossible for me. Maybe a bigger society like you could petition that. Maybe we could do it together, but I myself cannot. I, 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 I am sorry. Uh, but the very last thing, maybe I will add that. I think that overall the pudendal neuralgia and pudendal nerve entrapment and pudendal treatment is in a way complicated, uh, meaning we definitely want more physicians to practice it but we also don't want too many physicians to practice it because you want to make sure that you are concentrating the knowledge where it needs to be concentrated, like with, with, with like reference centers or with like places that are, you know, centers of excellence. Because what, what, what I often worry, and that's something that, that I'm not allowing if there is a, a, a physician every now, much less now, but in the past, that would say, I, I want to come and watch you do the pudendal surgery and then I'll be doing it. I, I am not allowing one person to come and watch one surgery and then do the pudendal surgery, not even knowing when to do it. Because, because most of the patients that 
think or their doctors think they need the surgery, they don't need the surgery. They need all the other treatments. And you can't come here for one day and, and learn all that. That's the knowledge that you develop over the years. Uh, so, so in a way, we need more doctors, we need more centers, we need more physical therapists, but we also don't want a pudendal doctor on every corner because then there'll be a lot of unnecessary and wrong treatments that are done. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go through real quick because I noticed there's a bunch of comments. Um, let's see. I'm going to see if there's anything. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, So there's one question that is uh, one person is asking, um, why is it that um, some people get relief from SI joint injections for PN? I presume it's some. There's you can several, show the model. <laughs> well, there, there's several reasons for that. So number one, if you look at the roots of the pudendal nerve that run that starts as S two, S three, S four, when you inject the joint from this side sometimes you get actually of the medic some of the medication gets to those nerve roots so so that's one of the reasons um the other reason is when there is a pain in the sacroiliac joint again there's muscles that are spasming around that area so when you do the injections you actually may be facilitating the the uh, uh how decreasing the muscle spasm around the area. So, so again, there, there's several explanations for that. Uh, but I think a lot of it is the, the anesthetic that actually um, will mm -hmm. sip into the roots of the pudendal nerve. So I have one question in reference to, I believe she's referencing decompression surgery. She's asking about... Um, the return of sexual function post-surgery? So, so the question is, is it a return of having sex with no pain or is it a return like of specifically? Um, so, um, you know, a lot of times when I pay, when I see patients who cannot have orgasm, that they were able to have orgasm and they can't orgasm now, um, a, a lot of times, I, I don't necessarily think it's a nerve injury. I think a lot of patients, it is actually the pain with intercourse that prevents them from having orgasm. It is, it is like when you know that there's an activity that will give you more pain. And, and a lot of patients, pain is not only with like vaginal penetration, the pain is actually with the moment of orgasm itself. And, and uh, I, I think uh, it is hard to achieve the orgasm if your if your body knows that it is going to hurt and it's not, not nothing that you're doing purposely it's your it's it's your it's in your subconscious so i think that if you are able to successfully treat the pain or treat the numbness because something we didn't talk about that a lot of pudendal patients actually instead of pain have numbness which is another sign of the nerve compression uh, that the orgasm will eventually return if you actually can get rid of the pain numbness um, and, and I see that in patients. Okay. Um, let's see. So there's another lady asking, can endometriosis specifically be the cause of PN? So endometriosis is another part of my practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still see quite a lot of endometriosis patients and endometriosis definitely, definitely causes muscle spasm. There is this mechanism it has a long and complicated name. It's called viscerosomatic convergence. Uh, it actually, in that mechanism, a lot of endometriosis patients have severe muscle spasm. And in those patients, there's a mechanism. Again, I'm, I, I do that all the time to patients. When your muscles are clamping around the nerve, specifically the operator internus muscles uh, clamping around the pudendal nerve in the Alcox canal, yes, you're going to have all the nervy symptoms burning, tingling, pain with sitting, um, all, all kinds of what, what we associate uh, with um, nerve type of the symptoms. But the situation where there's actually endometriosis on the pudendal nerve directly, it is 
extremely, extremely rare. So those patients have PN symptoms, not because the nerve is actually injured, but those patients have symptoms because there's a spasm of the muscle around the pudendal nerve. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, this must've been earlier. Um, so someone's asking um, for spinal cord stimulator, is it the same as a DRG or what is the difference? Uh, so again, I'm not the anesthesiologist. I don't place them. The difference is that you actually place them into the spinal cord or you place them into those front roots of the spinal cord where the nerves are leaving. So uh, the, just the front, the dorsal root, which is the front part of the spinal cord. Uh, there was a thought at some point that the DRG stimulator may be more effective than the spinal cord stimulator, um, but, but I don't know that. I mean, I don't, th this is probably not the question for me. Uh, they're both stimulators, they're both in a way spinal cord, it is just where, where it is placed in the spinal cord. Okay. Um, so this is a very, I think this is a little bit more of a, personal. So I understand if you can't answer it, but, um, so this gentleman has a urologist that needs to perform, a is it cystos cystoscopy? Cystoscopy. Oh, Perfect. <laughs> um, will this exam and possible biopsy make the PN worse? Um, he, it says he also, um, let's see, I have neurogenic, neurogenic bladder due to spina bifida, yes. uh, is it oculata, oculata? Oh my goodness, you guys are testing me with these pronunciations. So, so, um, um, so yes, so of course, you know, I actually have quite a lot of patients uh, that were, whose pain began after some kind of an office procedure where it was done with no anesthesia or minimal anesthesia where the pain began. Cystoscopy, uh, men, women, hysteroscopy uh, in women, all kinds of biopsies, cervical biopsies, uh, placement of an IUD, removal of an IUD. Um, and the reason why it happens, or, or the reason why you should be careful with cystoscopy, the reason why you should be careful with colonoscopy, if those procedures need to be done, they need to be done. Like it, right. if it has to be done, yes, you have to have the procedure. But the single most important thing is that you need to be properly anesthetized. So I think that in some patients that have this pain already doing a procedure in the office, a lot of doctors like doing procedures in the office. It's a whole other billing question why, uh, but, but when you do it in the office without anesthesia, the pain of doing the procedure or the irritation may make things significantly worse. So when I have patients, for example, very common question I get asked, I need a colonoscopy and I had like pudendal neuralgia symptoms get your colonoscopy, just make sure you're deeply, deeply anesthetized for that procedure. Now, ideally, ideally, patient should have a pudendal nerve block at the time, but I, that, that's because if you do the pudendal nerve block, then you really prevent any activation of the muscles, but I, I can't expect every doctor to know how to do the pudendal nerve block, but ideally I would do anesthesia, pudendal nerve block, and the procedure. Okay. Um... See, so I think we've covered this, but I'm going to ask the question. You you might have to repeat yourself. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> can you discuss treatment for patients that may have pudendal nerve irritation and entrapment due to engorged pudendal veins in the Alcox canal? So, so for for those patients, uh, I think so. Often when I do the or in the past, when I've done pudendal nerve decompression surgery, I would see the huge engorged veins next to the nerve. Um, so during the surgery, if that's surgery, then I basically just remove the vein. I remove the pudendal vein and the, the blood will find some other way to flow. Um, uh, and those patients, when you take the pressure of the nerve, it's great. In people that... Um, have engorged pudendal veins like in the perineal area or in the clitoral area. So if we're talking about this part of the nerve, when it goes to the rectum or when it goes to the, to the clitoris here, then I sclerose those veins. So I inject a chemical called Sotradecol. It's a same medication that um, 
that vascular surgeons use in the legs when you have varicosities in the legs. When the when the when the um, engorgement is in the Alcox canal, uh, well, it can also be injected. And I am actually, I mean, this is a very apropos question because um, last uh, Friday, a week from yesterday, I met with Dr. Duarte with the anesthesiologist and, and, and we were talking about, well, us working together where he can also do the sclerotization of, of that vein in the Alcox canal. Like I probably with what I do, I can't reach into the Alcox canal. I can reach into more of the surface. Like I said, the clitoris area, the vulvar rectal area. But if it's in the Alcox canal, the interventional radiologist should be able to do that. And that's actually something we are talking about possibly doing in, in our joint venture. Okay. Let's see. I can ask this. I don't, I don't know if you'll know this off the top of your head. <laughs> um, it says, what percentage of your patients need decompression surgery? Um, you know, I never kept uh, close statistics, but if I had to guess, and I think it's a fairly accurate guess, it's about 10%. Meaning out of the people that come to see me in the first place, I think only 10% end up with surgery because again, I am, I, I don't know, maybe I'm too conservative with that or maybe, you know, I actually do have patients that call me and say, I'm calling you because I want the surgery. And I'm like, you know, time out, hold on one second, tell me what happened. And, and then I'm like, listen, I, I'm i actually actively trying to talk out patients of surgery because, um, uh, uh, because again, there's other things that, I, I need to try first to convince the patient and myself that you have truly entrapped nerve because the surgery works when you have an entrapped nerve. Um, and I estimate that probably about 10% of patients end up with surgery. 10%, okay. Um, So I know this is something that you also discussed earlier. Um, how long should a successful nerve block last to confirm PN? So, so it really depends on what medications is injected, what medication is injected. Like, what is the local anesthetic that is used on the on the block itself? If if uh, if you're doing it purely for diagnostic reason, if meaning you're not doing it for anything else other than diagnostic reason. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can inject lidocaine that works for, a, for about an hour. You can inject lidocaine with epinephrine, which works for two hours. You can inject marcaine, which is five hours, marcaine with epinephrine, seven hours. Um, so even if it lasts for like 30 minutes, it, again, this, this doesn't treat your symptoms, you're still hurting. But if, if, if we're just doing it to confirm that it's the nerve, 30 minutes is enough. Okay. So I'm trying to see, cause I noticed uh, for time, we, we've been here a while. How are you feeling? <laughs> oh, I, I'm doing great. I am, I'm okay. good. I, I can keep, if there's questions, if there's people interested, I understand that patients have difficult time, you know, getting to me. I, I, I recognize all that. I, I wish I could change it. So, but this is your time to ask questions and, um, you know, maybe we can like do it again, have another one on like mesh, mesh injuries, which is again, a, a big, big part of what I do or something else. But, but for right now I'm here. So please ask, ask you ready for more. <laughs> okay. Ready for more. Please ask okay. away. Uh, one lady asks, can PN be caused by an anal manipulation of the tailbone? Um, I think what, so, so definitely the muscle spasm, because if you man, are manipulating the tailbone, I mean, it's the anus right here and the tailbone is right here. So you're, you're moving the muscle that's, that, that is the pubococcygeus muscle here. So of course, if you do something in this area, this will call the, cause the muscle spasm, will, which will then spasm or spread to the spasm of the other muscles. So 
I, I don't think you necessarily cause the entrapment, like scarring of the nerve. But again, in the mechanism where the muscle is compressing the nerve, yes, you can definitely cause that. You don't go and you decompress the nerve on the patient like that. You, you go and you treat the muscles. Um, oh my goodness. Ah, uh, let's see. So some some of these are some of these are just guesswork, I feel like. Um so someone asks, do people, I presume this is just a general question from your ex, from your experience with all your patients, do they ever get to sit again? Uh, yes, yes, but uh, I tell patients you have to be careful with sitting. You have to be uh, uh, never sit longer than what causes pain. But yes, patients do. Uh, you a lot of people do like lifestyle modification, like the kneeling chair or sitting on the big ball, like big like physical therapy ball or zero gravity chair. Um, but uh, definitely, I actually. I mean, it's an interesting question because I actually, years ago when I was more inclined into be doing like scientific studies, again, I'm in private practice, I have no resources, but we, I was looking for the parameter that is the best parameter to describe the outcomes from pudendal neuralgia treatment or pudendal nerve entrapment because it's difficult to, to measure the outcomes of this disease because some patients have pain with intercourse, some patients have pain with sitting, some patients have both, some patients have pain with bowel movements, urination. I mean, I don't need to list all this. There's a lot of people on the other side of the monitor that, that know what the symptoms are. So how do you actually measure the true outcome? And I actually created in my old practice a parameter that I called CST, comfortable sitting time. How long can you sit comfortably? And we use that parameter with certain treatments that a patient will say, well, my comfortable, so the time you can sit without actually needing to get up. And the patients will say, well, I can only sit for five minutes, but then with certain treatments, we would see that that time actually extends. So, so we started those scientifically you know, sound studies, but um, not doing them anymore. But that, that time was definitely increasing. All right. Is there any treatment available if the nerves have been resected? So someone actually have a removed pudendal nerve or uh, because that, that's so unusual. Um, well, if technically, if you could find the ends of the nerve, which I think would be extremely difficult because the nerve by itself is difficult to find in surgery, especially when it's scarred, when it's intact. Mm -hmm. uh, you could technically either reconnect it if there's not too much tension and then maybe over the time it will heal. Um, I know that neurosurgeons sometimes use like the cadaveric or like they, they actually not cadaveric, they take the nerve somewhere else from the body like sural nerve or peroneal or some other, they, they actually go in, take the piece of the nerve and they can suture that in place. This is not the procedure that I have ever done, but I find it extremely unusual that someone had a resected, re purposely removed pudendal nerve. Um, and I think in a patient like that, the, the, that, that, that patient should have much more diagnostic procedures to see what's going on. Like for example, we'll first address the pelvic floor because there's a pelvic spasm and see how that helps. Th then do like series of the pudendal nerve blocks and see if they like even numb you because if they numb you and you have no pain, then the nerve is probably still intact. Uh, meaning, you know, you block the nerve. And, and so, so I definitely would not want to jump and do like some heroic surgery like that, removing the nerve somewhere else in the body and transplanting it into that place without being absolutely certain of, the, of what happened. So, you know, in, in, in a patient like the one that you just mentioned, Cora, what, what I do, and I actually do the same for the mesh patients, it's really the same thing is that I really study the operative reports of those patients of like whatever surgery, and, and again, I do the same thing for the mesh, like what was placed in, what was done, what was, 
you know, I, I almost say it's like CSI, like crime scene investigation. Like I, I, I study those reports. I study the pathology reports. So if someone had a nerve removed, I want to see that operative report, but I also want to see the re pathology report. I want to see that the pathologist received that nerve and they identified as the nerve. I want to know how many centimeters have, have been removed. Because if it's a short part and you can actually find the ends, you can probably sew it back together and, and hopefully the nerve won't just reconnect and start working. It's not like the electrical wire. It, it still has to grow over the that connection and re-innervate the area, but still that, that would be one of the options. Okay, we have, um, let's see. Is there always muscle spasming with PN or can you have PN without muscle spasming? Uh -huh. That's a question I've been asking myself all my professional life. Uh, I think there's almost always muscle spasming. It's uh, it's almost unheard of that you, because the, the nerve injury or you know injury in the body just is, causes your muscles to spasm because it's a protective mechanism in a way. So uh, this is a fantastic question. This, this is a question that I ask myself many times every week. Uh, but if you ask me as of today, um, May 26th, 2023, the answer is yes. Okay. Let's see. Is it possible that a C-section can cause PN? Yes. So um, it definitely can cause PN and neuralgia. I mean, it can cause because, you know, how we, well, I don't do c I've never done, I've never practiced obstetrics. I mean, I've done the residency. Uh, I'm very familiar with the surgery, but uh, there's a lot of pulling and pushing and tugging and, and everything. Uh, so yes, it, it can, uh, it's probably unlikely. It is a nerve entrapment in the surgeries where you use the retractors, the deep retractors that go down in the pelvis, you can actually crush the nerve with the retractor, but with C-sections, we don't use those or they don't use those retractors. Uh, but you know, with a C-section, you also have to be very careful because this, if someone had a fan and steel incision, the, the, what patients call the bikini cuff, the cross incision. Um, you, you have to rule out the most obvious, which is the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves, because with that incision that goes across through the lower abdomen, which, which is kind of across here, you, you may actually get the ilioinguinal nerve. And because the ilioinguinal nerve innervates this area here, it may actually go all the way almost to the clitoris. Uh, it may be the ilioinguinal nerve injury. And, that is actually a very easy block. I mean, I this patient probably had that already, but if she did not, I would strongly recommend doing ilioinguinal nerve block first and, and making sure it's not that. Because if it's an ilioinguinal nerve, it's a quick fix. You block the nerve, you confirm it's the nerve, and then basically what I do in my practice, I go in and I surgically ser sever. I remove the piece of the... I know the patient talked about removing the pudendal nerve. It's a modern nerve. You do not remove the pudendal nerve ever. But ilioinguinal nerve, because it's purely sensory nerve, you can actually remove the piece of it. And, and recently, I, last, last Friday, I talked to a patient, I removed her ilioinguinal nerve. Uh, her, her pain, like the pain from the area is completely gone because she doesn't have ilioinguinal nerve anymore. She can't feel in that area, but she's completely okay with that. Okay. Let's see. Mm. Uh, so I have one person asking for clarification. Uh, she says earlier, you mentioned uh, when you go to PT that, you, ooh, sorry, it moved. Somebody commented. <laughs> um, you said that um, you should definitely see some improvement in two months. So is, is two months kind of a set rule or do you think it's, well, because I, I think you gave the example of two years and you said, no, you should have called me. Sooner yes. than that. So the two months is kind of my rule. Um, uh, it's, oh my God, I hope I don't sound too arrogant, but you know, there, there's not too many people that do what I do. So I feel I can have my rules and they're the rules because who else makes them? I feel that, so again, I'm hugely, hugely favorable of physical therapy, period. That physical therapy is the best thing for the pelvic floor, better than anything that I do, better than anything that anybody else does. 
but there has to be some common sense into that. And unfortunately, there are physical therapists, and I criticize them to their face. I lecture to physical therapists, I tell them to their face, listen, if you have a patient where you had made no progress after whatever amount of time, you need to think of something else. I'm not trying to take away your patient. We, we're working together. What, whatever I do, whether I do the surgery, whether I do the injections, pain pump, you are still taking care of that patient. You're still doing the physical therapy, but you cannot take patients through two years of physical therapy and basically say, there's nothing else I can do. So I think we as a medical society profession have to set, set a time limit. Like what is, what is the time at which you refer the patient to a physician. I think every new patient with pelvic floor pain, pita and neuralgia should actually start with physical therapist before going to a doctor. But I found this we, on the web. I'm sorry, but my, my Siri is trying to tell me. But, 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 we, but we have to set the time after which the patient needs to be handed over to a physician, not handed over, I'm sorry, co-management with a physician. In my mind, that time is two months. Uh, when I mentioned two years, I'm sorry if it was confusing. I said, I've had patients that have, I've done physical therapy for two years and nothing happened. I'm calling you today. I'm like, two years, that should have been sooner. Um, I think it's two months. Someone may disagree, say six months, but yes, there's some common sense that needs to be used in that. Now, if patient is doing physical therapy and he or she or he is improving, uh, then there's probably no reason, but if you are not improving, or if you've improved to a point and you're not improving anymore, well, time to look for some other treatments. Okay, let's see. What role do hernias play in addition to, um, is it labral disease? And does it they make broken. sense to have the repair? Um, well, so, so labral tears are the tears in the in the that ligament here around the hip joint. So, so that definitely plays a role. If you're talking about hernias, there's different hernias. I mean, there's femoral hernias, there's inguinal hernias, there's uh, all kinds of obturator hernias. Um, I don't think there is a specific hernia that that uh, compresses the pudendal nerve. Uh, there are hernias that will compress the obturator nerve, which again, it's another part of my practice um, where the obturator nerve is involved. Um, and uh, of course, in that case, you fix the obturator hernia. Um, the inguinal hernia, of course, can be pressing on the inguinal nerve. At, so so the, 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 there's definitely cases like that. The, but just general hernias, um, if they may cause muscle spasm and in that mechanism, but, but, you know, just a simple inguinal hernia is not going to cause pudendal nerve entrapment. Okay. So actually, I, this is not their question. This is my question. Uh, Cause you, you talk about um, working with patients that were damaged by mesh. Um, do you fix hernias without using mesh? So I'm a urogynecologist by training. So technically uh, I trained to be that doctor to fix the, pro, pro, unless to fix the prolapse, to fix the uh, incontinence. But early on in my practice, when I chose to see patients for pelvic pain, I chose not to do that anymore. So I am aware of, the treat, of those treatments, but I do not. Now, when I remove the mesh and someone has, prolapse or incontinence, I, I will do certain procedures to minimize the effects of that, but, but patients actually may need the repair uh, later. Uh, so I do not, but, but I do recommend, you know, the, the procedures that I recommend that are safer and less likely to injure the nerve. Now, the, the previous question, maybe the person that was asking the question said hernias, they, they meant the prolapse, like the bladder prolapse or the rectum prolapse. I don't know if that was the question because that's also a hernia in a way. It's a hernia that happens in the vagina. So, so again, I, I don't think the actual bladder prolapse or the rectum prolapse can cause pudendal nerve entrapment, but definitely patients who have prolapse. So let's say their bladder is falling out or they have urinary incontinence. So they cough, sneeze, and they leak urine those patients instinctively learn to spasm their pelvic floor muscles to minimize the effects of that prolapse. So 
fixing the prolapse may help with that, but that's not a true nerve entrapment. Now, when you do get a repair for the prolapse, uh, you have to be careful what procedure you're having. Uh, I, whether um, you use what's called native tissue, your own tissue, whether you use mesh, whether you use cadaveric tissue, there's many different ways to do that. Uh, and you just have to discuss that with, with your doctor, what, what procedure. Now, I, I do see patients that, uh, of course, were, were horribly injured by mesh, but, but I am not necessarily saying that like all meshes, all procedures are bad. I mean, there's definitely patients who, we, we know that there's so many patients that were helped by that. Unfortunately, there's a, a small group of patients that had, um, you know, a very bad outcome from that surgery. Yeah. So this, this confusion, this, this actually uh, confused me a little bit. So I'm going to ask it and then <laughs> I'm going to see what you say. Uh, this person is asking, are you still seeing patients once a month in Southern California? So I used to have, yes. So the short answer is no. The okay. slightly long, longer answer is I, I do have a California license and I used to see patients at the office of Julie Sarton, who is a very well-renowned pelvic physical therapist that was in Tustin, uh, like right next to Irvine, California. Uh, the, the, the issue is that, that this is so close to my existing practice that I, it almost didn't make sense because I didn't do any procedures there. I would like literally fly there to talk to the patient and I'm much better and much more effective doing it on um, telehealth. Okay. Once I went to California and I determined that the patient needs the nerve block, the patient needs the Botox or anything, they would still come here to Arizona. So I can do the talking part on the telehealth. There's no reason for me to fly to Irvine. And, and uh, now when I actually have that other practice in, in Europe, it's where I actually will be going and doing the actual surgeries. It's, uh, it's my time better spent uh, because pa patients from Southern California didn't benefit or seeing me in the Southern California office, because we would just do the talking like we're doing talking right now. Right. Okay. Um, so this person is asking, or they're saying that they're going to um, have Botox. Um, and she's looking for clarification. So if her muscles relax, but she still has her PN pain. She's asking if that means then that she is, um, that is a positive diagnosis for entrapment. Yeah, I think for me, this is the ultimate test. That, that's really the ultimate test. Uh, so if, you're, if you get the Botox and your muscles are truly relaxed, meaning ideally what I ask patients to do is to be seen by the same physical therapist before and after. Now, Remember, physicians are notoriously bad feeling the muscle spasms. I, I, I've been seeing patients like pelvic floor patients for the last 19 years, and I still trust my physical therapist more. So ideally, you want to be seen by the physical therapist. She, it's, all, it's almost always she, like 99%, evaluates your pelvic floor, and the muscles are spasming. You get Botox, you go three, four weeks later, your muscles are relaxed, but your pain is still the same. I think this is the most accurate test to say that the nerve is involved and trapped, scarred. That, that's the ultimate final test that, that I use in my practice. Okay. That's actually part of what my upcoming Phoenix criteria, what, what I talked about at the very beginning of this uh, talk. Let's see. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep up, but I'm <laughs> feel like I'm losing a lot of these. Let's see. Um, is there a relationship between extreme stress and PGAD and PN? Oh, how much time do I have? Okay. <laughs> is it so, bad that I want to say yes? <laughs> Even I know. I can just say yes, but you know, yep. I think our, our, your, your viewers, your members probably want a slightly longer explanation. Um, Absolutely, 100 million gazillion percent. So I mentioned Loretta already, the physical therapist who actually taught me so much that I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for her. So Loretta, if you're watching, I know you're not. You're in Hawaii, and you're you're. But uh, I I have to I have to thank the person that really um, helped me tremendously in my practice. So 
Loretta, uh, years ago, uh, we were discussing this topic and she asked me, have I ever seen a dog that is frightened or scared? And I said, yes. And what happens with the tail of that dog? The dog will tuck in the tail between the, the legs. That, that's, we've all, we all know that picture. We don't have tails, but we have tail bones, coccyx, the tailbone. We don't, we, we still have the muscles that wag the tail, mostly the coccygeous muscle here, and you don't really see them well on this side, but there's a coccygeous muscle. That's the muscle that wags the tail. That's what causes your, your tail, or I mean, our tails to, be, to go between our legs when we're stressed, when we're frightened. So it is um, absolutely 100% muscle spasm that is caused by extreme stress. So I have a, many examples of that. I, for example, have a patient who, um, uh, a male patient, he uh, one day got a phone call that his son was in a, a really bad car accident. And like the moment he like learned about it, the pain developed. Uh, I have another patient years ago, a, a young woman that uh, was studying for the bar exam, which is the law school exam, which is supposedly one of the hardest things to ever pass. And like the stress of like even thinking of the exam was making the pain worse. So 100% the stress should be treated, managed, but those patients generally have muscle spasm, not the nerve injury. Okay. Um, let's see. So this one um, is asked for men, how can you treat tingling and numbness sensation around the penis and the scrotum? Um, and I'm not sure I understand the second part. I'm gonna read it. It says, is dorsal of the penis nerve block an option? Absolutely. So answer to both, yes. So this is actually probably one of the most common symptoms I see in male patients is either numbness or tingling. Uh, so of course, just like any other answer I've given up until now, you treat the muscles first because a lot of these patients have significant muscle spasms. So often for those patients, you know, physical therapy, those suppositories that I talked about, and then physical therapy to, to treat all those muscles, but you know, the, the, the penis would be here. I mean, this is a female model, of course, but the dorsal nerve runs here. And when those muscles are spasming, is, it is compressing it. But once we get to the point where the, where the Botox is done, I have to bring those patients to the procedure room or operating room, surgery room, and, and I inject Botox into the muscles. And at the same time, I do a dorsal penile nerve block. So with the ultrasound, I find that nerve that runs right here or right here, depending if it's like, to the scrotum would be this nerve, the perineal, to the penis would be this nerve, which is the dorsal penile nerve. And, uh, and during the same procedure, when I inject Botox, I actually blocked, uh, inject those nerves with the anesthetic and steroid. That decreases the inflammation. And also in those patients, mostly women, not men, but in women, I also look at those veins that may be engorged in that area. Again, one of the symptoms of PGAT, um, and I also can sclerose the vein at the same time. It's all in one procedure, one anesthesia, one procedure. Okay, let's see. Uh, so clarification, um, what do you mean by muscle spasm? Um, are you, and the question is, I think of it as something extreme that causes pain in the muscle itself. Are you referring to muscle tightness? Yeah, this is, uh, thank you for clarifying. I, I cause, it, cause it spasm because the, the actual condition, there, there's actually, finally we have an ICD-10 code for that. Oh, it's called the spastic pelvic floor syndrome. Uh, but, but most of the physical therapists say tightness, not spasm, because you are right that patients feel or they think of a spasm of something coming and going like this, where it's actually the tightness, they're just tight. Um, it's the same thing. When I use the word spasm, I mean tight. Now, having said that, when I talk to patients, let's say on telehealth and, and uh, they've never seen a physical therapist and I have no way of examining them on telehealth, and I talk, start talking about muscle tightness or muscle spasm, patient says, I don't feel like my muscles are tight. You actually don't feel your muscles tight. If you have a Charlie horse in your leg and your shoulder and your, um, you know, in your cup, you feel like a Charlie horse because that's a Charlie horse. But in the pelvis, it does not feel the same way. So the patient 
not feeling muscle tightness doesn't mean that she or he does not have muscle tightness. Now, over the years, I've learned to do telehealth. So there are certain symptoms that I ask patients that are very typical of muscle tightness, and I can establish the muscle tightness often without examining patients. So for example, for women, if they go to the bathroom and they sit on the toilet and they can start urinating, they have to sit there and wait for the urine to come out and you know they run water or they make a fist and press on the belly. That's because of the tight muscles. Or when patients are like very constipated, that's tight muscles. Or when patients have not pain with sex, like not pain with intercourse, but pain that lasts after intercourse, like the next day, that's typical muscle tightness. Because when you go to gym, and you lift weights, you don't hurt when you lift weights, you hurt the next day. That's called muscle pain. The one that, the pain after bowel movement, the, the burning after urination, the pain after intercourse. So, so often I establish that muscle tightness by asking additional questions because I have no ability to examine the patient. Okay, so... I realized we actually skipped over a question um, from the original stuff about Botox because I noticed some people are asking about this. Um, is are there side effects to Botox, and um, are there specific people you would not consider Botox for? Uh, let, let me answer the second person per, part first. So I've injected patients who have multiple sclerosis. I've injected patients with myasthenia gravis. I've injected patients with spinal cord injuries, with, uh, with cerebral palsy. Um, never had any significant specific issue for that, with, with those patients. So um, really the only patients I would be careful injecting Botox are those that have like some anesthetic uh, uh, problems. So I need to do the Botox under sedation. Please do not have Botox injections while you're awake. It only worsens your muscle spasm because it's very painful. So when someone has like a significant medical condition where they cannot be sedated, then it's hard to inject the Botox. So that, that's the second part. The first part. Um, again, I've been doing it close to 20 years. Um, probably injected probably close to, I estimate about 10,000 patients over the years. Uh, maybe, yeah, probably about this much, maybe slightly less. Uh, there is a small risk of urinary incontinence because you're injecting it into the muscles that are around the urethra that hold the urine. Uh, that risk is um, probably about five to 10%. The incontinence, I've never seen it lasting more than a, than a week. So Botox works for three months, but I've never seen the incontinence for three weeks. There's even smaller risk of, of fecal, of stool incontinence. Uh, uh, but I have never seen anyone have incontinence with formed stool, like hard, regular stool. I've had patients that um, like had the Botox and unrelated to Botox developed diarrhea because you know they ate something and they couldn't hold the diarrhea because they couldn't squeeze as hard. But again, it's temporary. I've never seen it lasting longer than maybe a week. Uh, I've never seen anyone permanently. The only two uh, more significant complications over all these years, uh, there was one patient who, did, and again, this is out of like thousands of patients. One patient had an abscess in the pelvis uh, and that needed to be drained. So the radiologist had to put the drain to drain the abscess. I also had one patient that uh, developed a hematoma um, and that hematoma absorbed on its own. So with hematomas, you have to be careful with patients who are anticoagulated because you're injecting the muscles. So if someone is in Coumadin, if someone is on blood thinners, that needs to be stopped. If someone is on aspirin, you have to stop the aspirin. Uh, so those are like the things that we of course tell the patients. Uh, but definitely no blood thinners because you put, you know, when Botox is injected, it's not like one injection. It's like multiple injections in the muscle and each one of those is a bleeding spot. Oh. All right. Oh my goodness, guys. I can't keep up. Um, let me see. see. Let 
Uh, so someone is curious. Um, we've heard the saying that a nerve can heal on its own in about two years. Um, do you believe that some patients can just do nothing basically, and that it would heal on its own? Well, when the nerve is truly compressed, when there's like this hard scar tissue around it, I don't think it will heal. But again, we don't know that until we do the surgery. Um, and that's why it's so important to determine how did the injury happen in the first place. So, you know, if someone had, let's say a surgery where we think the stitch was placed through the nerve uh, or the mesh was placed through the nerve or that, that patient is probably not going to recover. If the, if the patient has pudendal pain because the muscle spa is spasming around it, then, uh, then yes, a patient like that can get better. There, 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 there are many people that, that get better, like from the time they make the appointment by the time they actually have an appointment with me, I hear that as like the first sentence, like, oh, when I made an appointment, I was really bad, but I'm actually better. Well, we still keep the appointment. We still talk about, you know, the things we talk, but there are people who get better. But just remember that if you truly have an injured nerve, there is a certain time limit to which the nerve will recover. And that study was actually done by Roger Robert, by my mentor, by the French neurosurgeon. Uh, and, and he uh, found scientifically that people who have nerve compression over 10 years, th their chances of recovery are significantly less than those that, that they have less than 10 years. So, so um, I mean, you can definitely continue the physical therapy and as long as you are improving, then that's good. But if you have made no improvement and you're like nearing those 10 years, the, the chances are you're not going to improve. Okay. Oh my goodness. I'm trying to find where I left off. It, um, there's just so many comments, so many questions. Everyone wants to know. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. I don't know how to pronounce this word. So I'm, I'm I apologize. I'm going to butcher it. Um, is it Arachno, arachnoiditis. Arachnoiditis. Maybe? You know, I am not. Uh, yeah. So that's the the inflammation of the layers in the in the spinal cord. Arachnoiditis. I. That's something that I don't. It's it's not my area of expertise. I, I don't okay. think I can answer that question. I apologize. I appreciate the honesty, and I'm kind of happy I don't have to repeat it because I cannot <laughs> say it. And you know what? I actually feel very strongly, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I feel very strongly that there are things that I know and probably know them well, uh, but I am very open about the things that I don't know. I, I you know, I um, am not going to be giving the answer to, to someone to, to, to the question. Now, I always urge the people with those unusual diagnoses to still make sure that they don't have the more obvious thing. Because, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, what, what is that saying that the only tool you have in the toolbox is the, the hammer, then everything looks like the nail. If, if, you, if you develop the pain and like the first doctor that you see is an expert in arachnoiditis, uh, then like this is the nail. So because the only tool they had is the hammer. So, so again, I can't talk about arachnoiditis, not my area of expertise, but I urge patients to still... Uh, rule out the more obvious pelvic function, the muscle spasm, um, you know, do the pudendal nerve block, things like that. So are there many of your patients on medications after decompression surgery? Yes. So uh, I generally ask patients to remain on the medications they were. And then once their symptoms start improving, then we we try to wean off those medications. So yes, definitely you stay on the medications, like you, you don't stop the medications at the time of surgery. Now the question may be, are they permanently on the medications? Like do they take gabapentin or Lyrica 
permanently. There's definitely patients that do, but there, there are patients that have been able to go off it. I don't think I can give you the exact percentage. I, I unfortunately don't keep that statistic. So, so can um, drugs like Ambien and Valium suppositories control PN and PGAD pain better than opioids? Yes, definitely 100%. So I think, uh, I, I don't know about Ambien. I mean, I, I'm hugely in favor of Ambien for like not sleeping, but but uh, any benzodiazepine, so diazepam, alprazolam, uh, clonazepam, et cetera, I think those medications are better muscle relaxants than anything else. And the biggest issue with PN patients is, is really not the narcotics or opioids, it's really relaxing those muscles. So the one that I found to be the most effective is, uh, is that Valium Baclofen Ketamine Suppository um, uh, because you actually deliver the Valium either rectally or vaginally. So even though it works centrally, you deliver it like more, more localized to the area. So either use that suppository uh, if you have a physician that will write it for you. If you don't, or if the cost is prohibitive or whatever, if, you, if you're in the area where they won't compound it, what I recommend that patients actually use five milligram tablet, vaginal or rectal. So oral tablet plays vaginal. Okay. You know, I actually had an idea, Cora, maybe that will work. I mean, I'm, I'm here to answer the questions. I'm not going anywhere, but if you have that many questions, and of course I can't get to every patient individually because, you know, in a way I, well, we talked about it, this recording started that I got up very early today to answer the questions from my own patients because Friday is the day when when my, my existing patients use their, use our portal and like answer like 40 questions this morning from like 4 a.m. for my own patients. Uh, but, uh, and we can still keep on going, but at some point I see that there is a lot of questions that, that your, your patients, your, your members would like answered. And I just had an idea that if you have a way of saving those questions, mm -hmm. if you, and you could send them to me, uh, maybe instead of me writing the answers, I could, well, we could figure out, I could like record a video and basically mm -hmm. just go all over the answers. Oh, and yeah. then, then you can forward it to your members because I, I really want patients to have that knowledge. I want them to have those question, questions answered because, you know, for me, I, I generally over the years worry that people may be getting like the wrong treatment or wrong information. It's not that I know the right information. I, I'm not I'm not an Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia of the pudendal pain, but I've been doing it for quite some time and I've seen a lot of patients. So may, maybe my answers are a little bit better. So we can keep on going, but when we get to the point where you're getting that many, if you're able to email me the list of the questions, yeah, I can I'll, definitely figure, do that. I'll figure out how I can record all the answers and I'll record it like this. I'll just go off of the, the questions. Just go down the list. I like that. Oh, yeah, I can't, it, I can't it, it keep up. <laughs> no, so. no, and I'm very happy. I, I do want to help everyone. And and when when we get to the point that we can't answer it anymore, oh, like, you know, th then, then please save the list and yeah. give me like a couple of weeks and I'll try to record the the video with all the answers. Sounds perfect. I honestly, I'm good with that because um, I'm. People can comment on this even after the video is done, so mm -hmm. that way I can just write down all those questions and send them to you after that if you like. I'll just record it like this again. I can keep on going, but but uh, but at some point I know that every answer creates like three more questions. Exactly. That's that's my problem. I'm like as soon as I'm like starting to read something, I'm like it changes because it moves up, and so then I lose where I was and I can't figure out. You know. Yeah. yeah so I, that's perfect. Have those, let's let's put them in the in the printed form, and like something that I can go off the list and you know not not this. Uh, this um, this weekend, you know, my I have actually my in-laws in town. My my wife is like my wife's graduation, and and so so I won't be able to do it this week, but maybe next week or a week after. Yeah, I'll record as long video as as needed to answer all the questions, and and uh, we can 
put it on your Facebook group if you want, or just send it to people. We can put it on YouTube. And, and definitely I'll be very happy to, even those most difficult or, or questions that are like, oh, that is like, I, I'm good for all this. I, I honestly, I really appreciate it. I was so nervous to do it, but honestly, this was amazing. Thank you so much for coming and for doing this. I know everybody on here is, as you can tell, super excited to talk to you. So, um, so I'll tell you, I wish I could talk to all the patients individually. I wish I could have that, but you know, one of the issues is like I said, that the patients who, so, so from like the ethical, medical, legal perspective, my, uh, biggest obligations to my existing patients and the system that we have, which I'm actually very happy with is that we have a medical record system where there's a portal. And I tell my patients that every Monday and every Friday, and, and today is the Friday, I will answer anything they need to know. They directly communicate with me. They, they don't call the office. The answers do not come from any of my assistants, but from me directly. So uh, patients like over, between Monday and Friday, write me a note and they say, hey, you know, I need this or I need the refill or I, I have a question or I want this procedure or I don't want this procedure, you know, or I like you or I hate you, whatever they say. They don't say I hate you. I mean, <laughs> they, may, they may think that, but they don't. And, and you know, and I literally spent um, several hours every Monday and every Friday where I generally don't schedule too many other medical activities other than maybe the perineal nerve surgery to answer those questions because those I have to do because those are from the patients where I have legal and ethical obligation of to course. do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wish I could do that for everybody, but you see that it will get almost impossible for me to do that. So if you would be willing to compile the list or just, yeah, just of course. a list of the questions, I'll sit down, I'll record it and hopefully get it back. And if there's more questions, we'll figure out how to, how to, how to get those answered. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, I will get those questions to you. And if you, if you are up for doing another one of these, if. I would love to do that if, if the members are not tired of me because they may want to hear from other people, but, but I'm up. Absolutely. We can. We can talk about the mesh injuries, which again is something that is, uh, it's still the pudendal neuralgia, it's still the pudendal nerve entrapment, and, uh, uh, but it is a sub specific category on its own, because mm -hmm. I believe that when patients had a pudendal mesh, I'm sorry, when patients had a pelvic mesh injury, I believe that the mesh needs to come out first before any other treatments. I think the pelvic floor needs to be treated next. and. And then actually, in a lot of patients, I see that the nerve that is affected significantly is the operator nerve, where I actually do the uh, um, operator nerve treatments too, surgeries and blocks and other things on the operator nerve. We haven't figured out how to put a pain pump in the operator nerve yet, but definitely that's in works. Me and Dr. Duarte, the radiologist, we, we're, we talk about it all the time. Um, and, then, and then after, but I, but I do have a patient um, who had a bad mesh injury where I took, first I took out the mesh, then I did the Botox and, and she was already improving with each one of this. And then she had a lot of groin pain, which is groin pain and the pain on the inside of the leg is not pudendal, that's operator. Then I did a, a robotic assisted Da Vinci operator nerve release, which helped with the groin pain. And then she was left with a, with a sitting pain in the buttock area. So then she had a pudendal neurolysis well, now I know she's back at work and she's sitting and back at work. She's better. She contacted me on the portal recently that the therapist feels that she, her muscles may be spasming or tight, whatever word they want to use more. So she's actually most likely going to come and get some Botox now. Now when the nerves are released, both nerves, pedendal and operator and the mesh is gone, the Botox may be very effective for that. So we can do another one on the mesh injuries or we can just keep on going uh, on the same topic, but let me, let me do the video with answering the questions. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll, we'll call, we'll call it today and I will put that list together for you so you can record another video for us. Uh -huh. I think a lot of people would really appreciate that for sure. So everybody have a good, um, as good as you can have. I know I always, when I talk to, 
my patients, I say, as good of a, as you can have the, ho the holiday weekend that's up coming up. And, and thank you so much. It was such a pleasure doing this. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Cora. Thank you so much.